What's up guys, you're watching To All The Crowd Rooms, a YouTube channel to help provide insights to the DIY music scene. If you like our free content and want to help support the channel, you can do so by liking, commenting, sharing, some subscribing, hit that notification bell, you get the alert as soon as the episode's posted. Today, we have a man who's been in the scene for quite some time now. He is always ahead of the curve when it comes to the music industry. We got Matt from I Set My Friends On Fire. Matt, what's going on, man? Good you guys. How are you? Thank you so much for coming on, dude. I've been a fan of yours f since the MySpace days. That's crazy. How old are you now? I am 29. Okay, so I'm 30, so we were like around the same age. Yeah, so I got to watch you over the years just evolve yeah. and... So you were still in high school? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was too. So. Yeah, so was when you were in high school, was like... Were you like one of the the cool kids in high school, or like? I, I wasn't. I wasn't cool, but I wasn't not cool. Okay. Like, people fuck with me if you knew me, but I wasn't like going around like high fiving people <laughs> and shit, and like wearing a varsity jacket. Or <laughs> <laughs> like, but I I, I was cool. like if you knew me, you you fucked with me, but. But what about like with uh like the growing popularity on MySpace and stuff like that? Like, did people treat you like a certain type of way? Dude, to be honest with you, um, not that many people knew because when Crank That first came out, like obviously it swept the nation, it swept every high school, and a lot of people knew. A lot of people knew about it, but for some reason, not that many people really knew about it at my school. Hmm. Yeah, they're kind of. It's kind of. It was a kind of like a preppy schoolish. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a like a private school. It was a public school. But um, eventually, they did find out because one day, uh, I was in class and everybody was fill, filling out their like college applications, and I was the only one sitting there not doing it. <laughs> And the teacher's like, what the hell are you doing? Why aren't you filling out shit? He's like, I was like, I was like nonchalant, nonchalantly, I was like, I, I got signed recently. <laughs> like, I don't need to do shit. And everybody looked at me like, <gasps> like in shock. Like, they know you they, I don't even think they knew I was in a band, no. But um, you're like, bitch, yeah. I'm going to the College of Rock and Roll. Oh, you are? No, I'm saying you. Oh. You're <laughs> like, what's the college? No. <laughs> um, whatever like i was it was on the spot like I, everybody found out in my classroom and then they made me play fucking crank that in the middle of the class no way. oh but my everybody, god but everybody was looking at me in shock like they couldn't believe it was me like with that voice because i'm pretty calm and collective and i'm i'm, I'm very chill you don't you wouldn't really expect me to be a screamer or or like just be on a goofy ass track like that you know so people were surprised spread like you know the word spread and then, yeah, people were kind of like treating me a little differently, um, but surprisingly, not that much different. Okay. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like it was only four, there was only four months left of my senior year when this started taking off. Oh, okay. So and not it, like it didn't really register to some people. So you're still just Matt, basically. Not even church. Yes, exactly. So. Uh, I set my friends on fire. Uh, you've had a unique style of music ranging from screamo to electronic to s the, now the SoundCloud rap and even like a funky style. Uh, what kind of music growing up inspired you to like just pick up a m microphone and start singing and screaming? Well, when I was young, when I was younger, before all that stuff, like maybe. 10, 11. I was listening to all the other rock shit that everybody listened to, like System of a Down, uh, Some Green Day, Avenged Sevenfold, shit like that. Like, I was like, it wasn't really like, I knew, what, like, when I listened to that music, I was like, there's gotta be something better than this. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I, like, started doing research and I found. I, I like found this site called Last FM. I don't know if you remember Last FM. For sure. But I started finding this band. Like one of the first band, screamo bands or post hardcore bands I found was this band called Secret Lives of the Freemasons. Okay. And when I heard when I heard them and I heard like the singing, like the, the kind of melodies and like the screaming, I was so captivated by it. I was like, whoa, this is like 
I've never heard anything like this, you know? That's fucking sick. No, I've also seen you, like, in videos, like, rocking, like, Grayscale shirts, uh, Blood Brothers and stuff. Were yeah, those yeah. S- I love Grayscale. Like, um, actually, some of my, a lot of people don't know this, but some of my screams are kind of based, were inspired by the way that that guy sc- screamed in Grayscale. Because, like, when he screamed, it kind of sounded like he was drunk. <laughs> it was kind of, like, sloppy. And like I kind of like took that influence when I did crank that to like sound like I was like yell screaming, but I was like you could, it sounded like I was drunk while I was screaming. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Not that many people do that kind of stuff. So I was like, I I wanted to mix that style with like intense screaming on top of it. So sure. It like you know I turned it into like my own thing. The one of the screams that you do, which is my absolute favorite, is like in like ravenous, ravenous, ravenous rhinos when you come in with uh, basically like periodic verberations. Uh, but you're like, yeah, ah. yeah, if I had a rocket launcher, it just sounds like I'm deranged. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that scream. I love doing, I, I do, I love the variety of scream. I don't like it when you hear a band and the screaming like tone is the same tone. It's like it just sounds like one big song throughout, like one song album that's mm-hmm. the same song over and over because there's no like, there's no variety in it. There's no um, what's the word? It's just one note the whole time. Yeah, you know what I mean. It doesn't doesn't have any character. Yeah, when I listen to your music, I hear like five to ten like different types of screams all over the place. Like, yeah, I kind of want to make it sound like there's more than just one person doing shit. Like it's like an army of screamers, like just going to ham. Yeah, man. Like uh, I don't know, I don't know why it developed that way for me, but I just I, I I realized I was good at doing high screams. I realized I was good at doing low ones. I was I realized I was do like good at doing like the drunken sounding ones. So like, why not just like put them all together? You know what I mean? Like absolutely, like, yeah. Just you, different textures. You, yeah especially because like you're layering the different like you got the lows and the highs on the same like at the same time like on your recordings and if you think about it there's different emotions with every type of scream that you hear like when you hear a low scream you know there's like business is like being met when you hear a high scream you know like the person's like angry and deranged um when you hear uh When you hear like the drunken scream shit, you know that I'm just trying to like have fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it all gives you a different vibe. I like putting all those vibes together. Do you ever hurt your vocal cords when doing it? Like, do you, are you screaming correctly or is it yeah. like a, just a fucking free for all every time you hop behind a mic? Bro, actually, not that many people know this, but um, I don't practice screaming before I go on tour. Or singing. So, like, my first practice will be my first show. Okay. And I don't like to scream without a mic. Because when you scream with a mic, it amplifies your voice. So that you don't have to, like, push too hard. It's mm-hmm. more like a mental thing. It's like, right. when I when I go to scream, I'm using my, my, my upper diaphragm and my lower diaphragm. It's like, it's like a yell mixed with, like, like think of it as like a, a somebody doing a voice for a cartoon okay like the way they position their voice to sound like or like you know what i mean like they do something they like position their voice in a certain way their vocal cords in a certain way that produces like the sound so i'm using my yell and i'm using like a, a character's voice at the same time to make it because I don't know, most people they take it too literal, and they feel like they make it. Like they they make it. They make it seem as if they have to like shred their vocal cords to get that sound out. And a lot of people do it without the mic, and that's not what you should do. So that's why I've been able to keep my scream consistent for like over ten years, because I only do it on a mic. Nice. That's yeah. good to know. That's yeah. And- the- yeah. You got to have a good sound guy too to make sure that, you know, you can hear yourself cuz then yeah. you're over pushing yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, especially when like the, you know, the music around you is too loud. Um Yeah, it's it's tough. Every venue is different too, so there's times where I can't even hear myself at all. 
That's and probably not off. good. Yeah, and like, I'll come off stage and I'll be like, oh, God, that was terrible. My, my girlfriend or someone would be like, no, that was actually really good. I was like, oh, thank God, because I, could, I felt like a deaf guy on stage, especially when, you, <laughs> when you're singing and you have to hear your notes, but you can't hear your notes. It sounds, that also makes it sound terrible. Right. It's hard, man. You got to stay in pitch. And I don't like to use, I've actually, I haven't told many people this. Some people know, but not everyone, but I actually lost like, some hearing in my right ear it's like mild mm. hearing damage over the years because i don't like to use in-ears or earplugs because it oh, doesn't wow. give me the same vibe or like the same energy i need on stage like i need to hear the actual <laughs> vibrations and the actual music to get into it and i feel like if my ears are blocked i can't get into it but i it was a price to pay because i fucking lost hearing so what do you do now uh i haven't well i was supposed to go on tour before covid and i was actually gonna try in years again um because the first the only the only time i've ever tried in years was when i first started 10 years ago and i, I like i fucking hated it as soon as i got it so i was like i'm never doing this again so i never gave it a second shot but technology is like way better now so i could probably I'd probably be okay with it, especially since now I don't want to lose any more hearing. Yeah, that's it's, what I'm about to say. Like, it's you, really scary, dude. It's like I, I was going through kind of like a a depression because one day, uh, as I was getting really good at making beats, you know, la la la, in my kitchen, fucking making beats and shit, my ear like, <laughs> like all of a sudden, like I felt this suction feeling in my ear. It was like, and then like my ear felt like I was in a plane and I couldn't hear it. I was like, oh, fuck, what is this? <laughs> oh, no. And I went to the doctor and they're like, oh, you just have an ear infection, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, whatever. Next day, it didn't go away. Next day, it didn't go away. It just, like, never went away. And, like, I went to ear, nose, and throat doctors, tried to give me steroids. It was terrible. It never went away. So, basically, when you lose hearing, that's what it feels like. It feels like you're in a plane and you can't hear through one of you. Yeah, it's it's basically like a clogged feeling. That's what deafness feels like. So I've that been, sucks. I've been dealing with that since the start of me announcing Caterpillar Sex, and nobody knew that. When was that, like 2012 or 2013? Okay. I, I announced it. I put out a single, and then after that single, that shit happened, and then I was like, I went into a really bad depression because of that. You know, because like, you know, obviously hearing and music go hand in hand. So I was like, dude, fuck, how am I going to do this without feeling uncomfortable every time I go to make music? But regardless, obviously, I've put out singles since then. So I haven't completely given up on like, because I can only work on music for like two hours at a time before my ears are like chill. Like, wow. Not enough. So Yeah, it's like on some Beethoven shit. Where like he lost <laughs> the hearing and like just get, still kept doing it. Yeah. I'm not comparing myself to Beethoven, but I'm, I just mean like I, I'm just referencing it because like he was losing. His, he probably lost even more hearing than I could possibly think of, and he was still making masterpieces. Come on, bro, you're the you're the the screamo Beethoven. Let's <laughs> let's not lie to ourselves. All right, All right I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, let's uh let's take this back uh, a little bit. Um. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, We Are the Calvary, but first I want to ask you if there was any projects that came before We Are the Calvary. Yeah, it was the Boost TZ thing that I was telling you about. Okay, so the for the, the people... Is. Yeah, so for the people listening, do you want to re-explain uh, what that band was? Okay, so Boost TZ. I was, when I was in high school, I was friends with a lot of Hispanic kids. Mm -hmm. Like in my, I live in Miami, so everybody here is Spanish. Nice. Everybody's Cuban or Argentine or... Mainly Colombian, but the fr my friends were like Colombian, Peruvian, some other shit, whatever. They all spoke Spanish all the time around me. I was good friends with them, but they just like, I was just kind of like in the background, like, I, I can't understand you guys, but well, fuck you guys. But like, they st still like talk to me normally, but whatever. I started a band with them, but they were all into alternative stuff. And I kind of still was too, because I was still learning about like, the whole screamo shit, emo bullshit. So basically, I wanted to do like emo screamo shit, 
and they were still stuck on their alternative. So the music would sound kind of alternative, but my vocals were very like the melodies were different than alternative rock. Right. So whatever. I tried to introduce screaming into that. They didn't fuck. They didn't fuck with it. I was 15, by the way. This okay. Room. And so whatever. Blah blah blah. Year goes by. I'm like, you know what? I'll forget it. Time to move on. I was barely even friends with them at that point anymore. Then one day in school, I had a friend named JD. He he wanted to start a band. He was like, hey, um, why don't we do a like a dual screaming type thing? He invited me somewhere. And that's where I met Nabil. Right. We went so to the, you we met went, him at that band practice. I met Nabil at a band at a first band practice trial, whatever you want to call it. But it was the first time I met him and first time we practiced. First time we did anything with each other. And it was like in some it was in our drummer's backyard in like this little barn looking shed. And whatever. So J D, the one who invited me to do like dual screaming with him came we both screamed that it was we were both screaming at the same time and I, I hadn't really had that much experience with screaming up until that point but i guess since i was so like happy to like get this like little opportunity because it was fun you know mm-hmm. um i was like out screaming him and people were noticing <laughs> yeah. like they noticed in the garage they're like, oh shit but whatever <laughs> like i wasn't gonna kick him out if he invited me in you know what i mean so we just kept the whole screaming like dual screamer thing going for a while mm-hmm. um for about like half a year and then he went to college okay and I was like, fuck yeah i'll stay i'm the like i'm the better i'm the better screamer here anyway i might as well just stay so i was in where the calvary for a year with nabil did you guys do any touring no 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 this is so straight, all local shit local but every time we did a local show it was really good nice like they, they had respect for it so no, I've seen some videos. People were going fucking nuts. Yeah, dude. It was those were the days, man, for real. And um so but after a year of We're the Calvary, everybody else was that was in the band wanted to go to school. Well, they needed to go to college. So but Nabil and I were still in high school. So we we're like, why don't you and I just do keep let's let's keep doing music with each other but just name it something else. And we- let's at this point, what was your friendship like with Nabil? I had a good friendship with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were like becoming best friends. We kind of were best friends. So besides the band, you guys would like hang out yeah, to his exactly. friends? Yeah, definitely. He had a very out there sense of humor. And so did I. Nice. We along, and we both liked the same music, so we got along, you know? Did you guys go to the same school? No, he actually went to a private school, like a rich kid's school. Um, and I, yeah, I just went to a public school. Okay. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, we met through that kid JD, you know? So if it wasn't for JD introducing me to him, I would have never met him. Wow. So, and then that's, uh, oh, so right before we move on to, I set my friends on fire because this sounds like this is where the creation happened. Uh, do you have any special memories or uh, fun facts about We Are the Calvary for the viewers listening? Oh, that's a good question. Um, good story of the show. Oh well, I mean, there's one time this kid wanted me to wanted to fight me at a show. <laughs> what happened? It was some MySpace beef. Oh, love me some MySpace beef. He was just talking some shit, right? And then he was like, whatever, fuck you. I'm going to meet you at the show. And it was a Wheel of Calvary show. I was like, okay, you want to come to my show and fight? Whatever, let's do it. (laughs) So he came and... Why do you want to fight you? He was just jealous. You you know when people just randomly message you on some, like, hate shit? I don't know if that's ever happened. (laughs) At least back in... It doesn't happen to me like that anymore. Like, but when it first started... People just randomly like, oh, you fucking suck, blah, blah, blah. Just like, fuck you. like, Or like, I don't know. I don't even remember what the contents of the fight was about. But he just being a little bitch and just wanted to. <laughs> so whatever. After the show, he walks up. He finds me somehow in the back of the venue. And he comes with his friend, like this 300-pound guy. <laughs> oh Jesus! Like, what the fuck, dude? I thought you were gonna fight me. Like you're gonna sick your, you're gonna sick your fucking dude on me like that <laughs> and um 
I'm picturing like you rolling up with Nabil and then this this dude rolling up with like a 300 pound dude. What's funny, dude, what's funny is I was eating a peanut butter jelly sandwich when this was happening. <laughs> As it came up to me, I was like, I was like, dude, I'm just like, why are you bothering me? I'm just trying to eat this peanut butter jelly sandwich. <laughs> like, why? You know? And then he just looks at me, this this 300 pound guy, and sp- Bits in my fucking face, dude. And I'm like, oh, I couldn't believe it. So I spit in his face and I threw the peanut butter jelly sandwich at his face. So like, <laughs> it hit his face and so did the, the jelly sandwich. You know what I mean? So he was pissed as fuck. He started throwing some bo- like some bows at me and I, I fucking, see. yeah, I guess he couldn't see. So he he like missed the first one and I actually hit him in the jaw like as he missed it. Yo, wait, I'm going to stop you right there. I just started playing Ravenous, Ravenous Rhinos in my head as soon as you threw the peanut butter jelly sandwich at his face. <laughs> hey, dude, if I ever make a music video for that, that's no, the first scene. I'm gonna Amazing. I love it. But yeah, dude, so we started swinging. I got a couple hits off of him. He never hit me. Luckily, I don't know how. Like My, my reflexes were crazy that day. But then I run out. So I'm like run away. And they're like calling me a pussy, but like, but at this point, I'm in thinking in my head, I'm like, dude, first of all, I got some hits off of you, and second of all, I I, I can't stay any longer because you, you you will kill me like if you find a way to hit me. So I'm like, I don't care if I'm a pussy, dude. Like, you're big. Like you're huge, dude. It's not fair. So it was running, running. Then Nabil's girlfriend at the time was there, and she was having altercation with I mean, something we like to call. Fun. This is yeah we, something we like to call a chonga in Miami. It's like a Spanish girl with the hoop earrings, talks all that, What's up, papi? Like, you know, like the, the, <laughs> like a chonga, right? Okay, never heard that before. That's awesome. <laughs> it's just like it, you, there's a, they're, they're full of them here in Miami, but whatever. <laughs> um, that was like a phase. But... Yeah, it was like a phase. This still goes on today, but it's, yeah. But anyway. So she's arguing with Nabil's girlfriend. Nabil's girlfriend at the the time was one of my friends. And this girl, they're fighting, and I'm just, I'm like, this is like right after the dude with the sandwich thing had happened. (laughs) And I'm I'm like, she's, this Chonga's fighting with, uh, with with the girl. And she goes to sucker punch her in the face. And I'm standing right in front of them. And as she's about to hit her in the face, I grab her fist like this, like some movie shit. <laughs> and, I, and I'm looking at the, at the fist, and I'm just like, "How did he do that? Like, yeah. like how did I just grab this?" <laughs> um, so as I'm holding this girl's fist in her my hand, boyfriend. her boyfriend turns me oh, okay. around and sucker punches me in the face hard as fuck. <laughs> and I have a lip ring at this point. And it split my lip. It's kind of like a little scar. You can't really see it, but it's like a tiny scar. They glued my lip back together. But yeah, what happened was I got hit in the face and I I looked down and I was bleeding, like dripping blood. And I was like, like, what the fuck just happened? Like, and then this dude from the venue comes out. He's like, oh, Poppy, you need to come see this. I was like, what do you mean? And so he brings me into this like really, really dark bathroom with like fluorescent lights. I felt like I was an American horror story. I look into the mirror and I see my mouth and it's like, split open like oh. predator shit and i was like ah! like dude i was like mortified when i saw my face i was like dude like i'm ugly I'm <laughs> i was like i was like a monster i'm a monster like, a, was, i'm beyond repair right now dude i was so worried that i was like gonna look like that forever but thankfully got to the hospital in time like, used yeah. medical glue oh know. damn was this before or after your set this was yeah. This is all after the set. Oh, okay, wow. good. Yeah. I was so, about to say, if you went on, if you did your set after that yeah. show, I'd be like, "Holy fuck!" That's Hell insane. No, I would not have been able to do that. <laughs> that'd be that would be badass as fuck it would though. Be badass. It would be. Maybe I'll just start telling the story the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of the craziest things I can remember. To be honest with you, from your Calvary days. Damn, was- two fights, one, one gig. <laughs> yeah, I think that that one experience makes up for the whole time. Because it was only a year of being Everyone in that band. Was getting to fights in that and it was story. cool because like the first band I was in was a year. We Are the Calvary was a year. So it only, it only took two year trials to finally get to Isambop. 
And as you can see, if you listen to Willie Cobra and then you listen to Isenbach, it's such a crazy, like you can hear the influence, mm -hmm. but it changed like completely. Right. It's crazy. Like I, when I go back, I'm like, how did we go from that to that? Yeah, no, I definitely noticed the the similarities and the differences between the two projects. Uh, one of them being uh, when you started Ismfaf, uh, you guys started incorporating, uh, in, you know, synth. Uh, yeah. You brought that into there. Uh, why did you guys decide to start incorporating that into your music? Okay, so, well, first of all... Um well, first of all, Nabil was the one that produced all this music. Okay. But um, I was really into hip hop still at that time. What were you listening to? Um, I was listening to like Bone Thugs and Harmony and shit. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, or like um, classic. Huh? And um, what, who else did I listen to? Eminem. Eminem. Type. Um, I'm trying to think 50 like cent. But 50 cent <laughs> like, like it wasn't really it, w it wasn't really but the thing is those influences didn't really affect our influences those are just like some hip hop things I was listening to at the time but um, all I know is that when I before we started the band I told Nabil let's not have any limitations with what we write let's just like let's just write whatever we want right um, so basically the first song that we actually wrote um, was ASL. Okay, cool. And we wrote that in his bedroom uh, on a program called Reason, which I actually still use today. And um, yeah, he was just playing around with some beats. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, um, I can't fucking remember exactly how it came about, but I don't know. It just, we just. It was nat. It was just natural. Like I don't know why the synths came in or any of the beats came, and we just started doing it like that. And then um, I take the so music home and write lyrics to it. And then the next day I come back, and then we. It was just like bada bing, bada boom. That's a cool creative process. So basically, yeah. he would he would demo out the stuff. Was the studio at Nabil's parents' house? Yeah, yeah. But well, we recorded cranked that in in my garage actually. Right now. So, okay. So. Um, yeah, I don't know why we did that in my garage, but uh, we did. And yeah, but most of the recording process was at Nabil's house. And um, so super DIY, like very, very, very. Like, yeah, because you know, I watched some videos, art, like you know, Apple, like on the rise, you know, yeah, books and shit like that, and we use it to our full advantage, you know. Yeah, no, because I I saw like in the vo his like mo vocal booth for you, there was like soundproof blankets, and it looked like it was just like a in a corner of yeah, his yeah. bedroom or some shit. Yeah, he was really good. Like for the time, he was really good at mixing what he did. Like the demos that we had, they weren't bad. But we obviously like after we were done with high school, uh, we went to Georgia, Valdosta, Georgia, and we re-recorded all the songs. And made yeah. them high quality in, in an actual studio. So the originally before you recorded the the full length, um, you guys put out this the self titled EP. So which was basically just a collection of three or four songs that were on your MySpace and they were demos, correct? Yeah, yeah. Nice, and that was uh, Beauty is in the eyes of the beer holder yeah. ASL. Uh, Crank that and uh, hardcore uh, a two step. Yeah. Nice. I remember that. Dude. Remember. Yeah, I I mean I was trying to find those demos and it, I mean it's if you look hard enough on YouTube you'll find them. Okay. For sure, dude. Yeah. But um, question: Where did uh in the infancy of Ismfaf, where did uh Nabil's side project um? The plot thickens. Where did that come along in all of this? I think it was it was either right before it, right before Zimbabwe or somewhere during it or some somewhere after we had like some free time. I don't remember. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, because it's like a hidden gem, like yeah. those songs. Uh, I read somewhere that in the Bill had that side project to help bring more attention to I Set My Friends on Fire. No, no, I don't think that's what the... I don't I don't know how people make... Some people make some pretty interesting uh, things up. But that does sound believable. I'm not going to lie. But um, I don't think that's why he did it. He just wanted to have something for himself. Mm-hmm. Because obviously, he liked to sing. And obviously, in his and Papa, I do all the singing. He had some background vocals and and stuff that I wrote for him to sing. But I think he also wanted to express his full nature as a singer and songwriter. Uh, but he, I know he did it for fun. He never did it to be serious. He okay. just wanted to have art out there. And it was good. Like, yeah. he was in a band. I forgot what it was called. Like, something... <sighs> Fuck, man. I wish I could remember the name of his band. But his band was good before We're the Calvary. He was in another band. Oh, shit. He did really good. I got to find the name of that. And I'll tell you. Let me know because I want to listen to whatever that they is. Interview uh, Nabil. Nabil. I don't know if he'd he be down, but he'd probably be, he'd probably be down. See his side of the story. I, I tried hitting him up. I wanted to try to reunite the boys on the, the Zoom <laughs> call, but, you know, he wasn't no, down for it. It probably well, would have. Not that he wasn't down for it, but he just did a podcast interview uh, with uh, your old manager. His, uh, I think it's his cousin or his brother. Oh, it was his brother. Yeah. So they have a podcast, and yeah, I, heard, uh, I saw that. I didn't hear the podcast, but I saw that he posted that he posted about it. Yeah. All right, let's get into it. Um, so for the viewers that don't know, let's talk about how Crank That blew you guys the fuck up and got you guys introduced to Epitaph. Okay. So you basically just want to know from the very start how that idea was even in Yeah, what was the inception of it? Um, so Soldier Boy, he drops this song. It is a huge song at the time everyone's doing the fucking dance at this time also uh pop goes uh or punk goes pop didn't even fucking exist no it didn't and and when they came out they didn't you ask us they didn't much. we they like we invented it but then they didn't want to put us on it did you reach out to them or no, no i didn't reach out to them but i mean come on if you're gonna do that they didn't acknowledge it and not acknowledge us it's like dude is it because we're brown? Like, Ooh. You know, oh, shit. <laughs> because everybody on, on there was white. You did, I mean? did you see the Finn McKenty punk rock NBA video where uh, he talks about those Screamo covers? I'm pretty sure I saw you in the comment section uh, saying some shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think I recall that. Yes, yes. I, I, call, that. I called him out. I called yeah. him out. He actually spoke about it. I called him out. I told him exactly <laughs> what was up. And then he tried and then he tried to like like low key throw me out there with the message that I sent him. Like he, he posted my reply, but it was a very legitimate reply, but he only posted it for a second so nobody would see what I actually told him. But it was just it, it like pissed me off because he tried to make it seem like, first of all, our cover never existed. And second of all, that Bring Me the Horizon was the one that did it first. Mm-hmm. And that kind of pissed me off because I was like, dude. What did Bring Me the Horizon cover? No, uh, sorry, not Bring Me the Horizon, uh, Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Fucking, no I mean, no shout out to them. That was fucking dope. But I mean, who did it first? I yeah, mean, he, he didn't acknowledge it, and it was like, dude, come on, bro. Like, get get your if you're gonna do this, if you're gonna do this little thing on your channel, do it right. Right, dude. I remember on LimeWire back in the day, uh, if you went to look up the crank that cover, it was Calvary Kids, and for the longest time, I thought like it was by a group called the Calvary Kids. Bro, every you're n- like, I promise you, everybody thinks that. Even I a lot of people thought that, mm-hmm. dude. and I could see why, you know, because in the thing we say, hey, it's your Calvary Kids. Yep. But they didn't realize that, you know, the title was We Are the Calvary. But LimeWire, bro, LimeWire was some yeah. shit, bro. That was like uh, Sex and Candy by Nirvana. Same shit. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's yeah. just like labeling songs the wrong name by the wrong artist. You know, actually, 50, uh, fucking Soldier Boy is the goat of that. Yup. Because he would name songs the same songs as other big songs. 
so it'd be much. like 50 cent but really it's crank yeah. that yeah dude like he, that's genius like he he knew what was up and it's just ironic that i picked a song to do a cover from like that that guy oh but here's the story um oh yeah let's let's get to it <laughs> when i first heard crank that on the radio i thought that shit was like hilarious like amazing i, I was like dude this is so funny like He's saying bouncing on my toes, super soaked that whole like he's saying some <laughs> fucking ridiculous ass shit here. And I was like, dude, how come no one's ever done a screamo like hip hop song? And I was like, dude, what the fuck are, like, what are we waiting for? So I went up to Beal and I was like, dude, we have to do this. This is gonna blow up. And he's like, No, this is a, this is a stupid idea. <laughs> I was like, Really? I was like, You really think this is a bad idea? He's like, Yeah, yeah. The week went by, kept, kept kept trying to convince him. He was still not about it. Finally, like after three weeks, he was like, fine, let's do it. Let's just do it. I'm like, okay, watch. I was like, going to be a watch. How crazy this is going to be. Recorded the song. The song actually sounded fire to us. Yeah. So I'm still in high school at this point. <clears throat> I release. I, I upload the song at night on our on our MySpace, and I and this is times where it's like not easy to get on the internet in like 2008, and I was in school too, so it's not like I really I really I couldn't get on the internet, and my phone didn't have no internet. Probably, <laughs> put, probably like took like 10 hours to upload a song. I love exactly. So whatever, I uploaded it before I went to school, came back home, and you know that expression like blew up overnight. Yeah. Okay, so mind you, I I uploaded this before school. Mm -hmm. Okay, came back home. I didn't go on MySpace because I didn't think anything of it, and it was still kind of a new platform, so I didn't really care. I took a nap. I took a nap. I woke up around like 5 p.m., and then I finally checked MySpace. I had 10,000 friend requests. Oh, fuck. I was like, what do you mean? And it was because of that song, and it was only up for a couple hours. Dude, that's insane. So I blew up over a nap, dude. <laughs> blew up over a nap. Let's go. <laughs> and and, and I, I was shook, you know? And every day, the numbers just kept piling in 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 100,000. And it got to the point where, like, there was this thing called MySpace Police. And they, I guess, would be the judges to see if the plays were real, the views were real. So they, we were getting so much traffic. They messaged us and they're like, "We are, we are going to remove your account because you, you are getting too, you're like, you're using bots to, to get your plays." I'm like, "No, no, like we're not. Like we're not. Right. These are genuine." It's like, bro, they're, I'm 17, 16 years old. Yeah, like they're like, "Sorry, terminated." Bah, took her account away. My hopes and dreams are shattered, bro. I was, like, I was like, dude, I actually did it. Like, I actually fucking did some shit, and you guys are going you know, to take this away. So luckily, when the page went down, everybody's profile song for Crank That went down, too. So they're freaking out. Like, oh, no, I got, we, we want to put this back on our fucking account on the profile. You know when you can choose a, a profile song? Yep, years. that was the shit. I mean, but the uh, but the nuns are watching has been my the my profile song like throughout awesome. MySpace. <laughs> That's crazy. That's awesome. Thank you. But um, so whatever. Yeah, when our page went down, that song went down too. So people were freaking out. So whatever. We made another MySpace immediately. Got even more friends, and then they messaged us again, <laughs> and they're like. You are using bots. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, it's like not again, bro. I think you're the the reason why the algorithm on all social media sites are <laughs> fucked now. You think about it. Think about it, dude. Probably. What's funny is on my Instagram, I had my thing as little Uzi Vert for a while. Mm -hmm. Like, but since nobody else was named that, and I had a blue check mark. They when people when looked up when people looked up Little Uzi Vert, my thing would pop up. So people were tagging pictures hey. with at, I set my friends on fire, thinking that that was Little Uzi's page. Uh, and you're I'm pulling the soldier boy. Like, you ain't Little Uzi. You're, Fucking you're, like fake ass Little Uzi. I'm like, what the fuck? I was like, I'm just kidding. Like, I'm <laughs> just trolling yeah. here. It's just a joke. You know what I mean? Wait, so but, do you have the actual Little Uzi Vert handle? 
or not anymore. No, no, no. But... no, 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 no just no. the name on his it, Instagram. Like before, oh. it would show like if you saw the if you, not looked, anymore, at, if you looked at a page a certain way, it would show the name. Like, Instead of the username. And then it would show the the check mark next to it. I know what you're talking about. So yeah, it yeah. looked like my name was Little Uzi Vert. Mm -hmm. It looked like I was him. But the thing is, you got to be retarded to think that because Little Uzi has millions of followers. Right. I have like 29,000. You like if you, you put really two and two together. Me, yeah, if you really thought that I'm sorry, that's that's on you, buddy. Like <laughs> you know what I mean? But um so you're getting shut down on MySpace, uh, yeah. and then Epitaph approaches you. Uh, did they no, slide in your here's the thing? Here's the yeah. thing. MySpace police were about to shut us down again, take the take the profile away again, and they did. They did it again. Okay. So mm -hmm. I was like dying at this point. I couldn't believe that they really, really took this away from us. You know. So luckily, uh, Nabil's brother came through. Kamal. Mm -hmm. He was managing us at the time. He messaged. He found a way to message my uh, MySpace, talk to them. He was like, "Look, these these are genuine plays. These are this is real interaction. Like this is real." And they're like, "All right, fine. We'll give you back the last page that we took." So we got <laughs> that page. Which was the most. Wanted. We got the best page yeah. back, and everything was all good. And then, you know, it just, and then it was cool because there was like an unsigned artist list on MySpace. Yeah, like, I remember that. Like the real artists, unsigned artists, upcoming artists. And we were always like gravitating between the Medic Droid and like, you know, Jeffree mm -hmm. Star. And, like, and then obviously LFMAO came out of nowhere and just took the charts and we're like, what the fuck? <laughs> or like Hyper Crush or whatever the fuck. <laughs> I don't remember that. I don't remember what they're called. But, um, yeah, dude. It was crazy times. MySpace is was the best ever for finding new bands, finding new music that you wanted to hear. And it was like the some of the best music ever that was like those times, like 2000 golden era. To 2008. 9 such yeah, even 9 like shit was really good. Mhm. Mm and it's a shame that there's not like a platform similar I mean, like you got Spotify, but like that, I mean, I discover a lot of like, I go through the similar artists on Spotify and that's how I find a lot of, well, that's uh, cool. But I mean, I'm talking about like the, the social media right. prospect yeah. of it, you know, the, the integrated, the top eight. Cause that's yeah. like the, the, it could be done. I think it could be remade. It just doesn't have to look like that. It could be, it could be good, you know? So they just need to fucking bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> who who well, wouldn't have on it? Done like the MySpace yeah, retro it's shit. Friendproject.net type. Thing. Yeah, I don't know if you saw and it. It's just like MySpace. Yeah, it looks just like it. You should go check it out. What is it? You Friends can make your own. Friendsproject.net. Friendsproject. Friendsproject. Yeah, Friendsproject.net. I think it's .net or .com. You can make your own MySpace again. Basically. Yeah. Oh, the, and you get to do the HTML stuff with yep. it too. Yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. saw that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's actually pretty sick. Yeah. So technically, you can make your own website if you know how to make a free website. Yeah. If you know how to do your own HTML, hmm. so you could use that as a loophole to make your own website. Do they? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they either should, they either should bring it back or there should be. I don't know. There's got to be some other. Somebody will do it eventually. I've even wanted to do a new site like that before, but it costs like so much money and so much brain so much effort like you have to dedicate your life to that show for sure fuck that shit <laughs> dude that's like a fucking empire like yeah 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 i'm not trying to be like mark zuckerberg or like any of these fools out here um, actually people sound soundcloud they seem pretty cool i don't know if you've ever seen their headquarters they're like german no. or some shit really yeah, I didn't expect that, but they they seem like they have a, a chill office. You know, it doesn't seem like corrupt. Hmm. Spotify. Interesting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Kind, kind of. I'm not. I'm not. I'm kind of kidding. Kind of not. <laughs> <laughs> um. Wait. So you said after the third time you got shut down, you got brought back, and then That's is the is that? Time. Oh, the second time. Second time. Yeah. Yeah. The second we deleted the first page entirely, made this page, took it down, but then they're like, okay, we'll bring it back up. Okay. Gotcha. 
And then how did Epitaph get in contact with you guys? Okay, so they're obviously seeing all this traction online. And we were a band for only four months. Obviously. Yeah. Never played a show, right? No show. No show. Just online projects. All online. They hit they hit Kamala and they were like, no, oh, Sue, which is Brett's long term assistant, mm-hmm. hit Kamala. It was like, hey, we've been hearing the hearing this band we love everything that we hear it's so different blah 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 blah, blah. let's get on a call we want to make you an offer we were like what the fuck i'm 17 at this point that's like one of the beals favorite uh labels at the point at that time because uh mm. every time i die was on there and he was a huge fan at the and i'm not gonna lie when i first heard the label's name i didn't even know how to pronounce it <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was epitaph or some weird shit like that <laughs> You know what I mean? I felt kind of embarrassed. But at the same time, I knew I saw the other bands that were on there and I was excited just to get signed. Mm-hmm. Period. You know, just that igno- like that's something I wanted. Right. But when you're 17, you know, you you only think about that. You don't think about like the contents of the contract and stuff like that. So just we just want to be the- famous. Yeah, you just want you just want the you just want to be signed. Like, yeah, motherfucker, I'm signed. Like mm-hmm. yeah. especially in those times. That was like something I always wanted and it happened and it was with a good label. Um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have that exact Slaughter album covered because I gave them the idea of a narwhal. Yeah. And that's what they gave me back. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is awesome. Like, I, yeah. I so just, that, that was Nick Pritchard, your artist for the first album for, uh, yeah, the, uh, you spell you can't spell slaughter or without laughter. I think, yeah, yeah, I think I can't remember his name, but yeah, it's, it's got to be him. Yeah, he's also uh, done every time I die, story of the year, Motion City soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, dude, I don't know, I don't know exactly what idea we gave him, but we just knew that we wanted a narwhal. And <laughs> but I like the way he did the narwhal because typical narwhals are gray and they have spots on yeah. their body. But and the pink was made, very MySpace. He made this look like a beluga whale, with mm. a tusk, which I liked. It wasn't I, like your typical narwhal. I never thought of that. You're right. Because there's no like completely white narwhals. There's no beluga whale things with tusks. Right. There's only those gray looking ones with the spots. They kind of like the, those seal spots. You know what I'm talking about? I know you're talking about. Yeah. So like I liked that he did that, and I was just like, and then the colors were very captivating, and the fact that nobody knew what a narwhal was back then, and still some people don't know what the fucking. Narwhal was. What about so the the intestine things? The intestine thing, I don't know where that came from. I don't know if we said, or I don't know if we specifically told him uh, a sea of intestines would be cool, or if he thought of that. I honestly cannot cannot remember okay. who said what. All I know is that when we saw it, we were like, damn, like this goes perfectly with the music. How did you guys come up with the name, uh, You Can't Spell Slaughter Without Laughter? So, do you remember, you remember Adult Swim? And, mm-hmm. like, they used to have these little commercials um, in between Adult like Swim episodes. Yeah. They were like little, like, 15 second short things. And there's one thing that came on one day, and it was like, you can't spell slaughter without laughter. And it was like a girl that was like, she had blood all over her face and shit. <laughs> and we're like, holy shit, that's such a, like, that sounds awesome. You can't spell slaughter without laughter. It's the coolest name, dude. So I was like, dude, yeah, that has to be our album fucking title, you know? Oh and then I felt, I felt like it went hand in hand with the band name, too, for some reason. Um, so... I'm just picturing you like getting fucking high on a couch, that coming on late at night, and you just being like, "Yes, there it is." Well, dude, want to know something interesting? Mm-hmm. I didn't start smoking bud until towards the end of the album. Really? How'd yeah. you get introduced to weed? Uh, I was writing. It was when I was writing Reese's Pieces, actually. Banger. I I was like talking about nihilism and shit back in those days. I don't I don't know what writing tip I was on but I was on some crazy ass writing journey sure. at that point and I was realizing a lot about shit I had, I had tried smoking when I was in 7th grade I didn't like it okay. it made me cough a lot and um, I just didn't like it 
Right. But when I after like this is like after like when I was about to be nineteen when I started smoking again. Or I was about to be eighteen, sorry. And I don't know. I just my friend had some bud and he was like, Hey man, you wanna try this again? I did. Smoked it. I loved it. I was laughing. It was fun. And yeah, that also helped with the music. But I didn't need that to write. Because I was writing things that I'm with Orange without weed. All the other songs that you heard before Reese's Pieces, which was one of the last songs we recorded, was no weed. Well, you know what? I, I've noticed that you've had, like, in your, like, lyric writing you have cr- a crazy vocabulary and a lot of thought provoking metaphors um how do you get inspiration for your lyrics and do you have any favorite lyrics that you've written um i get like inspired in many different ways actually um but i've always had a huge imagination since i was a kid like i've just always thought about the craziest shit and the craziest scenarios and like what would what would happen if I was in that scenario you know what I mean and I I really like like doing analogy making analogies and just comparing things to things so it's like you know it's basically like poetry Mm -hmm. so I've always been into that but when it came to writing lyrics a big factor also that played in was the melody of the line you know Mm -hmm. what I mean like I feel like if you have a good melody and you have good lyrics and you both hear those things together happen at the same time like it impacts somebody so crazy like damn that was such a good melody and he said something crazy yeah that delivery yeah so i was already good at melodies and as far as the far like the big uh vocabulary stuff you know when i was in school i was always trying to look for different synonyms for words that that were kind of basic Mm -hmm. so i was like you know what Finding a long word, like a big word with multiple, with multiple, um, with multiple syllables in it, uh, will get my point across faster if I just say the big word and then like a couple lines after it. And I also like to be mysterious, so, so I, I I like to put like many different meanings in one line or a punchline so that people because people will come to me yeah and like ask me if the song is about this and then i'll be like yeah and then somebody else will come 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 up to me and ask me about the same song and say is it about this and i'll be like yeah but it's a different meaning so like what i'm trying to say is you can take it so many different ways and that's what i aim for when I'm double writing. entendre yeah i just like to make people think and like really really like what the fuck was he talking about you know what i mean bro in college i wrote a paper on the meaning behind ravenous ravenous rhinos you really yeah i Dude. what i get from it is that it's you trying to express uh making experimental music and how people are going to receive it yeah that's basically what it was nice you know, just finding the meaning of music why why is music the way it is you know like why uh, like, what do we get out of it? You know, that's you know when you know when I say the end, when music is my mistress, it, it'd just be a fling. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, what am I getting out of this? I'm getting uh, low uh, royalties, and <laughs> <laughs> that's funny as shit. No, but I'm I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But I, I've never made music for the money. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's something that helped that has always benefited me when writing music because when I don't go in it thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to make this and make some money, baby. Mm-hmm. Like I go into it thinking I want to write this and help people that hear it in any way, um, like in, in any shape or form, you know, cause there's my, I, I've been realizing that my mute, the Ismfov has been getting encaptured by every generation that keeps getting older. Mm-hmm. Like you know when you when you're young and you don't know what bands are and then you get introduced to it and you're like oh. so like my band's always gonna be loved by every generation because they're just finding out yeah, about it every, yeah. just like a new band to them every single time right it's kind of like the oldies when like the oldies get passed down to the younger generations and they're like yeah I love the oldies but <laughs> sorry not everybody talks about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but 
<laughs> I do so many accents all day that sometimes they just like come out. But um, you know what I mean? Like, there's kids now who are 11 who are hitting me up like, oh my god, I love this. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like I'm I'm like a new band to them all over again. Right. But it's- like. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to set it up that way. It just happened because there's so much different things going on in the music yeah. that it makes you appreciate, like, the original. yeah, you know what I mean? Especially people who are getting now just getting into, like, post-hardcore music. Yeah. Right. No, it's it, it, it goes across all different genres, so I'm sure, like, people that are into one genre, they'll find what they like out of it because it's so yeah. fucking experimental. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I don't know. People always told me that Ism Fof, I don't know if this is a, a good thing or a bad thing, but people always tell me that Ism Fof is, like, the gateway drug into getting into other bands that scream and stuff, like metal. Like, oh, I never used to listen to screaming music until I heard Isn't Ball. Like, people tell me that all the time. And I'm not I'm not sure whether to take that as a compliment or as, like, a... You know what I mean? It's, it's weird. Dude, I would absolutely take that as a compliment because I like to see uh, Ism Fof as a staple to scene music and scene culture and stuff like that. Like, your guys' first record is going to go down in history like you really created something special that people are going to like you know you see like dark side of the moon like album artwork you're going to see that fucking narwhal 20 years from now you know what i mean it's going to be something that's talked about years to come i hope so dude that'd be awesome yeah. i'm i'm dead ass about it man i i'm calling that shit i, I appreciate you thinking that way man. Seriously. I, yeah i've always wanted you know to make classic like that's why i take so long to write music because i don't i'm not just trying to give you some fast food music i'm trying to give you a, a soul cooked home cooked meal you put that love and, in it yeah I, I want it to last i want it to be everlasting you go back to it anytime that you need it and just take something from it like you know what i mean like, i i want to make meaningful music that's my thing um, I want to get back to You Can't Spell Slaughter Without uh, Laughter. Um, when you guys recorded it, you were starting to say that uh, you recorded it in Georgia, um, which I didn't see what studio you guys uh, recorded that at. And you guys recorded it with Travis Richter from um, uh, from First to Last? Yeah. Um, well, actually, Travis came down to Miami to help us, like, I guess get hyped or produce some stuff. Is that it, like Nabil's house? It was at Nabil's house. Yeah, he stayed with us for a bit. Um, he wrote he wrote a few things, but mainly he got us like in a good mindset. You know, he got us like hyped up. He 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 was like hyping us up. You know, nice. he really believed in us, and he he thought what we were doing is was unique. And like he really helped with but the nuns are watching and stuff like that. Like just getting like the whole sassiness, like the in the beginning of like the song, I think. Like, like, like we both, me and him, would bounce each ideas off each other, and we were kind of like, what would be some cool Blood Brothers type little thing, but like make it even sound a little gayer, <laughs> like, but like make it not gayer, but like more, more like more flamboyant, very, like, flamboyant, like yeah, yeah, and like we I've- all. And that, we, the Blood Brothers influence, I never thought of that for that song. That's that's so on point. Like, you guys nailed it. Yeah, yeah. And, like, we, we wanted to do it, but, like, kind of, like, hide it to where it didn't really seem like we were trying to take it from them. Mm-hmm. But it was, just, it was just, like, an influence, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Just, like, that sassiness. We wanted De- to add that sass. Definitely. You know? And he helped with that. And, like, he was always good at hyping me up. And Travis is actually really, really good at writing lyrics, too. So... You know, he'd help me. Like if I didn't, if I couldn't think of something specific, and I couldn't get the words out of my mouth, he'd he'd help me, you know, replace those words that I needed. Um, but yeah, um, other than that, no, he. I don't think he came with us to Valdosta. It was just me, Kamal, and Nabil. Yeah, we just recorded there. Uh, it was it was at a place called Earth Sound Recordings. Um, this guy named Lee Dias. He's done a bunch of bands like Mayday Parade. Is this like, uh, program drums? 
Um, yeah, but they were they were real samples of drums. Okay. So they were programmed real samples of drums. Gotcha. That's why they sounded like legit. Because right. Because we took our time and found those samples and beefed everything up. And I don't know. The way he, like, the way he did it was really unique. I don't know how to explain it, but it was it was definitely something that was like I'll never forget. You know, it's it it, it, it was weird because um I, I wasn't really comfortable like where we went because like his his recording studio was completely black and it was like it was like vampire like. <laughs> it was cool, but but back in the day like. I was like kind of young, and I was like, "Damn, I just came out here to Valdosta." <laughs> where, when, layer. And I'm like sleeping at a hotel every day, eating Sonic, and like this this hotel was like a motel, and it wasn't very nice. And we'd go, and we, I mean, it was it was fun. Don't get me wrong, but like at some point, I was I heard I actually heard the things around with orange way too many times in the studio, and I I, I hated it. Mm-hmm. I was like, this song sucks. Like, this can't be our single. And the Bill's like, what are you talking about, dude? This is this is the single. <laughs> like in my head, I was like, I hate it. Like, because I heard it so many, so many fucking times, repeating over and over as he was mixing it. I think it was just driving me nuts. But like once once it was released and people fuck were fucking with it, I was like, all right, all right, I like this song again. You know, this song's cool. That's funny. So, Damn. So epitaph. Did, did they pay uh, Travis to uh, come down to help you write the songs and then paid f- to send you guys to the studio in Georgia? Um, he did, yeah, they definitely paid Travis. Um, Travis also gets some form of royalties on that. I'm not sure, actually, to be honest with you. No, and- no, they just, they, it was just like a one-off pay, I think. And... Um, but as far as like paying for the hotels, I don't know, dude. It's a good question. I don't know if they advanced us and then we used some of that of the advance to do that, or mm-hmm. if they did that like separately. Because at the time, Nabil's um, brother, who was our manager, he was holding down our card. I didn't really have that much control <laughs> over the money, but at that time, I didn't really care. Mm-hmm. I was just like, I want to do music. Like my mind was, my mind was not on money at all. You know, it's and it's still not on money, but nowadays it kind of has to be because of you know everything that's going on in the world, not being able to tour and shit. And like, you got to so figure out you, how to make a living, yeah, as an artist, because the entertainment industry is completely down. Yeah, dude. But it's cool. It's cool when you are independent because let's say for whatever reason my next album blows up right let's say it does okay i'm not saying it will i'm just saying let's say it does if i post that myself i get 100 percent royalties you know Mm -hmm. because when you're when you're with a record label you know they take a percentage and when you put a song a song for a dollar on apple they automatically take 30 cents off your dollar so you're left with 70 cents and if you're with a label they're going to take their 50 50 percent so what that's 35 percent and if, then if you have two people in the band you got to split that 35 cents you know what i mean so it's like you're gonna get this many cents per song hell no but for me since there's no label i get the 70 cents i don't have to share that 70 cents right so let's say i sell minimum of like 40,000, I'm being humble, 40,000 uh, copies mm-hmm. or even less, 15,000, let's just say, because <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't We're really throwing numbers out there. I'm just throwing numbers out there and I get to keep all the money. Solid. Oh, yeah, fuck, the, fuck you, record label. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I could do my own promotion. Like, I could do my own shit. I don't, I don't need, you don't need that anymore. And plus, like, 
when you're uh, an early artist, I feel like you don't have the network. You don't have like, you don't know what you actually need to release a project. It's someone yeah. like you, that's more seasoned. Yeah. That's kind of been through the fucking shit storm and have, yeah, have yeah, done yeah. it all. You know Absolutely. what you're doing. You're right. You're right. You're right. For sure. For sure. But what the cool, the cool thing is like also for people who aren't established, who do go with the route of not going with a label and distributing themselves online, if they accidentally pull out that one hit, like a little Nas X shit, mm-hmm. and don't sign, and you make that little Nas X money from your independent distribution company, bro, you'll be you'll be a millionaire. You wouldn't need all that stuff. But the thing is, the music the music business is so dirty that they they somehow lure, lure you in even though they see you're making mad money because they, they tell you oh i'm gonna put you in this magazine i'm gonna put you in this movie you're gonna do this with this you're gonna be with Nicki minaj blah, 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 blah. like they, they like suck you in like i think i saw something about drake going independent and if he does that the whole music industry is going to completely crash <laughs> <laughs> that would be crazy but i I don't know i don't know that's interesting i didn't hear about that but yeah that would be interesting i i don't fuck with drake because of how he had like that little beef with x mm-hmm. oh wait did he yeah oh, he, didn't he, a, he say like bro wait, remind me i forget they had they had some beef where drake stole the look at me like melody like he like drake stole that melody and put it in his own song and acted like x didn't exist but Mm. in the background he had hit up x saying hey i wanted to do a song with you and then they just something happened where he he didn't they didn't get a chance because he had to go to jail and then while x was in jail drake releases his song it's like like it's the same flow as look at me Right? And, then, and then when X got out, he he was like, "Yo, you you stole my shit." And he's like, "I don't know who you are." He's like, "But you, oh, but your people reached out to me while I was in jail, so fuck you. You do you do know who I am?" And then they got into this beef where he's like, "X is like, I'm gonna fuck your mom, Drake." <laughs> like some shit happened. Whatever. They got to a really really bad weird thing going on. And even in this, do you know like Travis Scott and and Drake, like how they they made a song called Sicko Mode? Yeah. You ever heard of it? Yeah, of course. In the music video, they have some for a split second. They have somebody dressed up as X with like the same haircut, same dreads. Like you know when X puts his hair in a ponytail. Yeah. They had somebody like that, and they they have an asteroid hit him. <laughs> For so, one a split second in the video, like to to just like be like, and this is after he died, like oh. to show up, like fuck you, like yo like, fuck that no, dude. dude, Drake bro, you're savage dude, like at, like <laughs> you gonna do it like that, like the guy's dead. Yo, you know how we were talking about like uh, sad lyrics after like uh, rappers dying? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. doing this off camera. Um, the the thing that gave me the biggest chills was the X music video for, uh, I think it was sad. Yeah. Bro, you have no idea, yeah. bro. Let me tell you something. I went, you know, the memorial, the open memorial yeah, they had for him. His body. No, I went to that. I saw his body. In the Wait, castle. no jumper. No, they, in Miami, there was like this, there was this, uh, amphitheater or like some kind of like baseball theater and they turned it into a place where people can walk in and it was an open it was jaw in an open casket and you walked past him and you got to like pay like hey like you you pay your respect yeah you can't take your phone inside you can only come see him first walk up to the stage and there was like a line for like like three hours and i waited to that shit just to see him i saw him laying there and bro he looked like an alien dude he looked like an yeah, alien from a his yeah but like just like his dread you know his little dreads yeah he looked like antennas and like the way he was like sleeping i was like dude this is trippy as fuck and like <laughs> it was fuck. it yeah, was crazy. really sad because people were bawling the yeah. entire time because they were playing his music as yeah. you're walking and like a slideshow yeah they were pl- they were showing a slideshow dude it was like the craziest yeah. shit ever and then 
two days later, I see the music video for Sad. sad yeah, it was and I'm like, and I'm like, dude, I was just there. Like, I was tripping the fuck out. Like, I was like, dude, he really, really knew he was gonna die really soon. That's like the most like creepy shit. Like when these soundcloud rappers who've passed away and they have some shit like those music videos or lyrics about ta- like basically predicting their deaths it's absolutely insane it's it's very insane but at the same time it's like it adds so much like i don't want to sound fucked up but it almost adds so much character more character to the lyrics that they previously wrote before they passed away it does like you like when you first hear it before they pass away you're like oh okay they're just having fun they're just talking about like they're, they're being ballsy you know they're they're saying like shit like without even caring about what what could happen like, without jinxing themselves like you're being brave enough to jinx yourself that's yeah. it and then when you hear it afterwards it makes all the coding talk and all the percocet taking talk it makes it it makes it that much more intense that they're gone because they're really, really struggling. You know what I mean? And then you go back and you hear that music and you're like, damn, like you really, damn, someone should help them. Like, yeah, you hear the, the hurt in their voice and how nobody gave a fuck. And, uh, you know, they basically are sacrificing their soul. They're sac- they, they sacrifice their, themselves to us. If you think about it, because, it came here, made a huge impact, and because music is the biggest impact in the world, I don't care what anyone tells you. Movies, awesome, but music, I think, is way bigger yeah, impact. That's true. I agree. You know what I mean? Came here, made a huge impact for kids, and then deuce, juice. Came here, made a big impact for food, deuce. Like bye, like it. But like, I feel like if they wouldn't have passed away, it wouldn't have opened up people's eyes more. It wouldn't have helped. Like, of course, it didn't want them to pass away. But it just made their music that much more validated. You know what I mean? I like, feel you, man. Yeah, it's trippy. I, I and like I told you, I don't, I don't like to write about that stuff. It's scary because I, I you, my girlfriend would tell you, it like saying stuff like that is like almost like casting a spell. Yeah, it's like it's like it's a, a form of energy. Dude. Yeah, it's a form of energy, and people. Are, when people do spells, people chant or yeah. make little songs. Yeah, to and like if you, the and if the more and more you talk about that shit, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Dude. Like it's gonna fucking happen. Well, yeah, it's like the, the the shit you consume is like what you are. So, like, if you're like constantly saying negative shit, like you're gonna be bringing negative energy. I was listening to some little Uzi vert the other day, and uh, there was a lyric in there that was just like sounds very. I set my friends on fire. You know the song, uh, New Paddock. Uh huh. You've had it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. You mean. yeah. That song. Do you know that part where it's just like, uh, I'm an octopus. I cannot breathe underwater, so I put diamonds on my tentacles. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've always thought that that was very. I set my friends on fire. Yeah, dude. I heard that too, and I was like, that, that line. I was from like, Uzi? that's very familiar, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I don't know. That's crazy. Um. <laughs> so those pictures on your Instagram are they uh? of uh of trippy red and little uzi rocking i set my friends on fire are those real dude all right i'm gonna i'm gonna give you a chance to to guess if they're if they're real or if there's something behind behind them like if there's something to it what do you think do you think they're real i think they're photoshopped (laughs) you're absolutely 100 (laughs) percent right Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hoping they were real, though. No, dude. Yeah, a lot of people I, think they're real. A lot actually. of people, a lot of people think they're real. Um, I thought it would be funny to do it because I, I've done it like before. I fucked with Drake. Mm-hmm. I did it with one of my shirts, like one of my clothing line uh, lines. And people also thought that was real, so I was like, well, yeah, I'm just do it again. But like, it, it, it it's a, it's funny because you, you can't really tell, you know, because of the filter. If people right. call you out, who gives a fuck? Yeah, nobody's ever nobody's ever said like anything like that's Photoshop. I'm a comment say only haters will say this shit's Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, but um, yeah, I, I I'd love it if they wore my shit. That'd be that'd be awesome. <laughs>
Dude, fucking, if you did uh, some kind of collab with Trippy Red, I'd be so about that shit. Trippy, like, every single album, he, he, well, first of all, he puts out music way too fast, and all of it's very quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Trippy Red, I used to, like, when Trippy Red first started, I was, I love Trippy Red. Nowadays, I think he's still good, but I, I used to like his older melodies more be honest with you i think he's changed it quite a bit and well not that he's changed it is i i feel like i'm hearing the same melodies like recycled too many times right but yeah i don't know i think old i I think young trippy was was the best trippy in my eyes because i I felt like he was more humble and trying maybe try to put more effort into the soul of the music even, I could, even like how you were saying about the screamo thing how like different like types of you know like what he does with his voice where it's all weird like yeah. And shit. yeah it just sounds like he's just getting weird with it and having fun yeah he's like a cartoon character yeah yeah dude he looks like oh, yeah. a fucking super I'm villain not gonna lie, dude. I, I fuck with trippy i fuck with uzi i fuck with um x juice all those motherfuckers the fucking the boys, you know the, the the SoundCloud era boys. Do you fuck with Six Nine? Um, dude, to be honest with you, like I don't really know. I I I fuck with him to an extent because I re- I know that what he did is like something that no one could ever do and get away with. <laughs> like his marketing, his marketing genius is just like insane. It's, yeah, it's so like dope. when I first saw him on Trippy Red's Poles music video, mm-hmm. I was like, "Who is this? I was like, Who is this clown kid?" Dude, I'm not gonna lie. The first time I saw the Gummo music video, I was like, "This is trash. Like, fuck this. Fuck this guy." And then, yeah. I, and then when Kuda came out, I was like, "All right, I'm on board." <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but he finessed. He, he. I mean, like, how did he? <laughs> how did he do what he did? Like. You know what I mean? Like he had, it almost seems like he has justification for everything. It's either he's manipulating us to think it's that way, or if there's some plot holes in the story that we're not really too sure about, but you know, he justified why he snitched and it's because, you know, they fuck, they fuck his baby mama and all this stuff. So yeah, I'm not going to be loyal to you if you fuck my baby mama. <laughs> and he came out of jail. People still fuck with him. He broke the record for for uh, Instagram viewers, two million people. Like, were you were you watching that while that was live? No, actually, oh, I dude, didn't... me and my boy Bezos, we live stream as we were watching it. Oh shit, dude! But, but yeah, like he that knows was groundbreaking. How he knows how to speak. He knows how to manipulate people. So. I appreciate his genius. I appreciate I appreciate him being himself. That's what I, I think. He's a unique he's a unique individual, that's for sure. Did you uh, see the the Hulu documentary? I saw a part of it. I didn't get to see it all, but it's cool. Like I didn't know half the the shit in the beginning of like the pre six nine stuff when he was just as Takashi. Oh, yeah. Like uh with Zilakami and stuff. I I mean I knew some of the stuff with Zilakami, but like I never saw like the sh- like the early music videos of like uh, with him with also like his uh, his clothing brand that said like eat pussy and shit like that. Oh. I was actually supposed to do some stuff with Zilakami. Yo, uh, we we just never got a chance to do anything. Like this is before Z- Zilakami is getting more recognition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm sure that. He just kind of either forgot or doesn't doesn't want to do it anymore. I I don't know what it is, but it doesn't offend me. It 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 is what it is. You know what I mean? Bro, you're I. That is such a good collab. Oh yeah, it'd be cra- it'd be crazy. It'd be <laughs> crazy collab if it was real. And actually, the dude from Suicide Boys, Ruby, mm-hmm. um, he hit me up the other day, and he told me how much he loved my first album. And then he told me one time I played a show with his band in Louisiana before he was in Suicide Boys. 
and he came up to me and he asked me if I could wear his shirt on stage. Did you? And me back then was like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> nice. And so I, I wore his shirt on stage, and then like 10 years later, he messages me saying, hey, I don't know if you remember, but I used to be in this band before I was in Suicide Boys. I asked you to wear my shirt. You did. I never forgot about that. Thank you for doing that, blah, blah, blah. I That's love your, fucking cool. I love your music. I was like, dude, oh, fuck. I would have never known. Like, So what's the deal? When are you collabing with him? I don't think... <laughs> like, if you want me to be, like, blunt up front, mm -hmm. I don't think he'll ever see this. But if he does, fuck it. One day, I sent him a beat, and I, I was like, hey, let's check this out, see if you can hop on it. And my beats are very progressive, so like you'll never hear the same thing twice. Maybe you will, but most of the time you won't. And like the parts just keep switching and switching, like transitioning. And there was a part at the end of my beat that was, it's like it went crazy. Mm -hmm. And then he he ignored me for a while, and then one day he posts something on his Instagram, like a new song for his new new album, and he basically took the beat that I sent him manipulated it a little bit and made it a part of his own music and didn't say anything to me i called him out about it he read it and didn't respond i was like damn dude really like that so he just wait so this is the same dude with the shirt yeah the same the lead, well, one of the sing one of the uh, rappers in suicide boys what so you he had this moment with you when he was a fan of I Set My Friends on Fire. Then you wanted to collab with him. You fucking sent him a beat and he fucking stole it and pretend that he doesn't know who you are. Yeah. And well, the thing he's, the thing is, he also reached out to me. Uh, you know what I mean? Yo, so, what the fuck? So, you know, you think that he would be cool about it and, um, you know, want to do what he does bro what's the deal with stealing music like just write your own shit like yeah i, I know man i know dude. it's fucking whack you good bro yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me a sec okay yeah anyway uh yeah dude people steal music all the time and it's it's insane. I, I don't know why why people do it. I wish people were more original. Yeah, my roommate, he's like super into like all the trap shit and I was into like all the emo shit. And if you've like seen our channel and stuff, like we have rappers over. That's mostly like my roommate reaching out to like Philly rappers to, yeah. to come over here. And then uh, I do like all like pop punk and emo bands. So that's oh, the okay. vibe. That's where that's fire. But yeah. good music's good music. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know. He he started this whole wave, Little Uzi, like the whole, like just the way that rappers rap now. He, with the ad libs and all that. If it wasn't for him. What'd you, you think know? of the double XL 2016 uh, cipher? Between him and like Kodak and Savage and shit. It's fire. I, it's probably one of the best. One of the best ones. Those are the. There were so many legendary rappers in that. Who do like, you think was the best one? I don't know. I can't remember. They were all good. They were all, they were all kind of on the same level. Like they're all having fun. You could tell. Dude, so many people talk shit on that cipher, and so many people in general just talk shit on the whole like SoundCloud wave. And it's like, especially like with like, I think it's comes from a place of just people not understanding a new wave and like what's going on. Like with the whole like dyeing the hair crazy color. Um, new sounding music just over the top like face tattoos and shit like that yeah. and i had a question for you with uh you can't spell slaughter without laughter what yeah. was the the critics and like the overall because like you guys like coming out with that album what was like the initial reactions to it we either had extreme love or extreme hate um it's funny because when uh, you can tell him to come down, by the way. When um, AP wrote an article about us, mm -hmm. 
they wrote some dude, I forgot his name, but he wrote a shitty ass article about us talking shit about our band, about our song titles. He wasn't even talking shit about the music. He was just being a straight up hater talking about how bad our song titles were or something like that. And he gave us one star. Good. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah. So he gave one star. I was like, okay. So you get half a star. Yeah, yeah. I'll get to that. But <laughs> Astral Rejection, when that album came out, AP also did an article about it. And the same guy wrote it. But guess how much, guess how many half, stars he gave us? Half, half of star. half of a star. Oh, a quarter of a star. Yo, I would rather get five stars or one star because you know you're doing some shit right. Yeah, bro. A lot of people sent them ma- like e- like mail, like hate, like fuck yeah, you guys. Like, how could yeah. you? How could you? Do, like, especially with a quarter of a star. I like, bro. Come on, bro. Like, we were we pioneered something here. This isn't just an album. Like, this is the. This start. is this is like a groundbreaking s- step for some people. You can't just shit on it like that, bro. Like, you must have some personal hate against it or something just so close-minded because like there's so much shit going on in that album like how can you just disregard all of that i don't know dude but <laughs> to be honest with you i think that it the j the the hate actually generated um attention. some more attention because people are like there's no way this could be half a star let me go check this out and then they check it out and it's not half a star shit it's like you know so in a way i think it may have helped in a weird way did at the time when you like see like half a star on your album did that like kind of like blow your ego like it made me want to work harder but at the same time i like that's the first time i saw the music industry for what it like really was was like damn damn yeah no because there's a lot of critics a lot of people in the comment section like how do you deal with all that yeah it's like but well, okay, it's funny because when you know when you think of people type writing hate online, and you see a whole thread of hate, you think of them as they're all hanging out in one crowded warehouse talking shit with each other. But in reality, they're individuals in different separate areas of the world they, mm. that don't even know each other. Right. So who, who gives a fuck what individual think? Or who, who even gives a fuck of what a crowd of people thinks? It just looks like you're getting hate from so many different places, but these people don't even know each other. These people, who knows who these people are or what they're doing as they're commenting? Like, no, I I can't imagine how it is to be in the in the spotlight and just like, just being able to have your mom look up who you are as a person and just be like damn people really don't like my son or his music you know what i mean yeah. well luckily she saw the good the good stuff good That's side good. Of it. never really saw any of the bad stuff plus she wasn't really the best with the internet back yeah. then so <laughs> like she really knew but the first time she ever really saw something is when she came to my show and saw that people were coming up to me asking for autographs and that's when it really hit her like oh shit like, like who are you like no, I saw that video of uh, when you played that show. I think it was in Russia, where uh, yeah, that was crazy. The kid broke down crying because he yeah. couldn't make your meet and greet. I remember taking that video too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very emotional. He was very emotional. He what? couldn't believe it. And the How? people outside of the world are way more passionate and about appreciative. Music. Wow. Yeah. So do you like playing out of uh, country more? I do. I do. But the thing is, they're not as crazy as people. Like, the mosh pits are not as crazy as America. Really? Yeah, they're a little... More chill. They're a little more pushy shove. Okay. Kind of. It's not as intense. Um, they still go crazy, but... Um, but, yeah. Russia has shown us probably some of the most love and passion. You know? So... Dope. We need to go there again. It's just really fucking cold. I can't. It's too cold, dude. <laughs> can't handle it. It's freezing. I cannot handle that shit at all. Um. So I uh I made kind of like a timeline with like all the things that you released that went along with you can't spell slaughter without laughter, and it kind of fascinated me with like the the order of how it went. So the first thing, right even before the album dropped, you released the first episode of the Chronicles of Ismfaf. Then after that, um, you guys released the album on October 7th, 2008. Then, after that, 
um, November 21st, 2008, you don't drop a music video. You drop Sex Ed Rocks, the collab with Smosh, which yeah, yeah. wasn't even a song on the album. So it's just like, here's a bonus song. Like, yeah, you guys yeah. got to wait another 10 months until you get the things that rhyme with orange music video. Yeah, yeah. Insane. I don't know. I don't know how that stuff, like, it was weird because, so we were making the Chronicles and, and for some reason, at the same time, simultaneously, without us even knowing, Smosh was in contact with Epitaph and they were like, hey, we want to collab with a band, but we're not sure, but we're, we wanted, we wanted to hit you guys up to see. So it was their idea to, to collab with a band. And at the time we were doing the Chronicles and I was fans of Smosh, but they didn't know who we were yet. Mm -hmm. And Epitaph's was like, oh, actually we just signed this band called, I set my friends on fire. And they just so happen to be doing like little YouTube. videos on YouTube oh, as well. Yeah. So they sent them our videos, the Chronicles, and they thought it was funny. And they're like, dude, what the fuck? This is the perfect band to do, do a collaboration with. So we went, we flew to Sacramento. Bada bing, bada boom. They wrote some of the lyrics. I wrote the chorus. I wrote one of the. I wrote. I wrote the fucking uh, Dennis Rodman verse and shit. Like all that. Kind of shit. And uh, it was that was it. We hung out with them for like two weeks at their house. It was fun, you know. That's crazy. It's crazy to see how Smosh like transformed over the yeah. years. Yeah, like Anthony, I'm not sure if he's on Comedy Central, but he's on Comedy Central's YouTube channel now doing oh. like the interview type things. I, I speak to him sometimes um, here and there. Uh, but yeah, I, I like that he kind of did his own thing because I mean, how long could you do Smosh? Yeah, it got way too corporate -y. And I'm surprised Ian's still over there. Well, when we, when before they, before, like this is in 2008, Anthony was already already thinking about trying to leave smosh nobody knew that he was already wow. trying to leave. but because he because he knew they had an age demographic that was like 17 and under because they were showing us videos that they've never shown anyone before and these videos were so fucking funny but they were brutal as fuck so they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't put it on they the channel label. so they because exist somewhere they're they're somewhere but they're that's like the humor that they should have went with but they knew that the money was in keeping a younger age demographic and doing more silly humor. So that's when shit that went down the line. They were getting told more how to like produce their stuff and what kind of content to put in it. And they were running out of ideas. And when you're writing things for babies, you have very less freedom, you know? So he didn't, Gosh. he wasn't with that the whole time. So he Damn. wanted to do his own thing eventually. And I can't blame him. Oh, you know? for sure. And then Ian, Ian is kind of doing the same thing that I'm doing with Isn't Flop. Like I'm not going down just because one person left. Right. I'm not going to ruin my career. But he's still cool with Anthony. I'm still cool with Nabil. Like, you know, so everything, it's weird. Everything's all good. Yeah, everything's, Every everything's straight, but things are completely different for two, for us. Like completely different for Isn't Flop and completely different for Smosh. But he's in a different predicament than i am because contracts and shit. drama and like acting is way different than like music and putting out music and stuff like that sure, sure. um so is it safe to say that we probably won't get a uh a, another smosh collab in the the near future unless somehow there was like a petition <laughs> Were you forced, Ian and Anthony, to accept the idea? Then yeah, let's get a hundred thousand signatures going, and let's see what happens. I'll hit him up. Was there ever like a thought of a third video, like a, a, an idea that like just never happened? It was never a thought of an idea specifically, but we did speak a couple times. Like, yo, it would be cool to do some another third one. Tr need the trilogy. Why not, dude? <laughs> Why not? Like, what if, you know, especially during these times, it'd be interesting. Because you know? the first one was about sex ed. Second one was about like high school, and like almost on like some things that are with the orange kind of message. And then the third one, I don't know what the third one. We talked about some alien shit, but Ooh. I don't think we. It was just an idea. You guys should do uh, something like on some thirties shit. 
Oh, maybe, we, yeah, maybe we could do some, like, Elvis Screamo. <laughs> You're wildin'. Like, El- Elvis Emo post hardcore mixed with tribal. Uh, I don't know. This is how you write music. I know this is how you write music. <laughs> You're like, you just write a bunch of genres in a fucking hat and then just pick out three of them and just like, all right. I'm telling you, if I was in a room with Kanye and I shared some of these ideas <laughs> to him, I feel like he'd have a field day because I feel like his brain is just like, do, 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 do. Like he just keeps adding shit to the mix and he, he, he gets so into the music. So I don't know if that would ever happen, but if it ever did, I'd be like, fuck it. You know? Bro, you vote for Kanye? Nah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask, you know, from one musician to another. I had to, I had yeah. to see, uh, you know. Yeah, I feel you. Um, no, I wouldn't vote for anyone. I've, I've never voted yeah, for anyone. I'm independent. I just don't want my hands dirty with any bad thing that anyone ends up doing. Bullshit, like fuck, especially. I'm not with it. But interesting story. Um, so I'm Egyptian. I don't know if you know that, but mm-hmm. I was conceived in Abu Dhabi and I was going to be born there. But my parents were like, nah, fuck it. Let's take him to America so that if he ever decides to be a U S to ever have, if he ever gets the chance to be the U S president, he can have that opportunity. <laughs> so technically, <laughs> when I, when I reached the age, I don't want to be president, but how funny would it be? If I if I did some Dave Chappelle shit, I was like, like I'm fucking president, motherfucker. Like I just did it, like you know, like it would be crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Imagine me as president. <laughs> I'd vote for you, bro. Dude, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Now that we're boys, I I you definitely got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, dude. I wonder if there's any like uh, they should do some thing now where like people can put their pre votes. Like and lock them in years before any election. Like I mean, for- you could just write uh, during the election. You could put in the, the for Kanye, for instance. You could write his name into the 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 write in part. No, I mean like if people can pre qualify their votes for like the year twenty, let's say twenty twenty eight. Right. So like pre-saving a Spotify link. <laughs> yeah, it's like saving a Spotify link, but for somebody you want to vote for, and you can already do that just in case the person decides they want to uh, become president. Yo, Matt, why did we never get a crank that music video? <sighs> Good idea, dude. I don't think. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> like I wouldn't know how to make it work. You know, I, I, I mean, if somebody came up to me with a big budget, like, "Hey, Matt, let's do a five hundred thousand dollar crank that music video right now," and I'll do it really cool, like some thriller shit. All right, <laughs> let's do it. Dude. All I'm saying is. You were getting your MySpace like taken down for the amount of plays you're getting. I'm so surprised like a- Epitaph didn't say, "Here's money. You're making a, a a fucking music video for Crank That." Yes, I'm very surprised, dude. Honestly, I love Brett from Epitaph, um, the owner. I don't know. If that's who you knew what his name was, but he kind of just was like he he believed in us, but he wasn't really investing as much as if he could as much as if he, as much as he could have okay you know what i mean mm-hmm. if you would have just invested just a little bit more mm-hmm. and on top of that i don't know if you know this well i'm sure you do but isn't Fof was at the peak of our career when the bill decided to leave right we were like booming so People were waiting for our second album they were like stoked, like, what's this going to be? Right. And then Epitaph rejects that album. And then Nabil gets kind of butt hurt because, you know, we spent our time doing this. We put our real darkness and sadness, like real actual darkness and sadness into this, into this album. And he was already like 
he was already kind of not wanting to be in the band anymore because he wanted to go to, he wanted to finish school. Um, and he was also getting tired of touring. And every time we toured, he didn't really socialize too much. He was in the van, like kind of to himself. And I don't blame him because, you know, some people are just like that. But, yeah, for sure. And he wanted to do other things. And I can't hold anybody back from doing what they want to do. You know, like if that's your passion, that's what you want to go do. Go do it, brother. Like I support you. Right. So I wasn't going to hold that against him. Um, it did suck. But if it wasn't for that ever happening, I would have never learned how to produce music on my own because when he left i was like who's gonna write the music now like somebody has to try to actually think with that ism fof like thinking to write to like enhance the music so i took initiative and started writing beats and now i now i know how to sample anything like koala's fighting over a beat and can make it sound crazy yeah, like, it's fucking sick. A lot of crazy shit. Like, there's a lot of crazy shit I have, and I just haven't released it because I feel like the timing, like I told you, timing is everything. And think about when Trap started getting more traction, like 2016 maybe, right? Mm-hmm. That's when it was really blowing up, like Little Uzi, then 2017 X, 2018 Juice, 2019, like all these other rappers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I'm kind of like trying to be like the last domino. And that's going to be incorporating the rock, the experimental rock and with the fucking post trap hardcore, music. Like, there's emo trap, but have you ever heard of emo post hardcore? That That's a whole, or trap post hardcore. That's a whole different thing. It's not new metal. It's not the gent. It's not any of that bullshit. It's like. It, those those precious Isenvolf chords, but over cool beats, sometimes transitioning into live band, going back into something that has like a lot of eight oh eight into it. Like, I mean, you could hear that on your your newer stuff, like uh, "Don't Take Me for Pomegranate" and like Versace exactly. Tamagotchi. Like, that's exactly what you're describing right now, and I that's think it's exactly fucking dope. What it is. Yeah, but what's crazy about that is that's just those were just appetizers, like. Mm-hmm. I wasn't even trying to really release those, but I needed something to release. Right. And that's what I had at the moment. But the stuff I have is like way, way, way more upgraded, like of that kind of style. Like it's take it's taking that style to the next, next, next level. So that was just like a little, like, just a little taste. Make, you know what I mean? Just like, a little snack. You know, yeah. And it's it now. Now it's out there, you know. Now it's now it exists. That genre exists, but nobody's doing it. Is he Who's, the first one again on the fucking head of the curve, man? You, I don't know, bro. I don't know, but I've I've always known. I've always known that hip hop and trap were gonna be the, one of the biggest genres. Mm-hmm. And as I was making beats, naturally liking like liking hip hop, I was trying to write stuff with crazy 808s and like mystical sounds and you know like just crazy sounds and stuff that makes you want to like move your head up and down just enjoy and it just turned into me writing more stuff with beats and finding interesting samples to put over them you know i i don't want my stuff to be replicated so i try to make this the 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 sample sound so unique that you wouldn't be able to find it anywhere yeah you it's like not even an instrument at the point. I can't even explain. I'll show you some stuff, like, personally. All right, so we were briefly talking about Nabil leaving the band when uh, you were working on Astral uh, uh, yeah. in Rejection. Um, yeah. So was there a tension between you guys? Because from what I've read in from previous interviews, um, because the album got rejected or got yeah, yeah. us uh, got shelved by the label um was there tension between you guys at that point um the only tension there was well, for, first of all it was a very dramatic choice and it was very out of nowhere mm-hmm. and it was during our peak so obviously i had some kind of like ah dude why did you do this but at the same time, I had to remember that you can't hold back anybody from doing what they want to do. Like, that's what you want to do. Dude, I'm not going to force you to be here. But what we had was super special. The dynamic was very, very special. 
but I feel like when he was writing the OG Astro Rejection, the one that recently came out, yeah. he was like, okay, so for the first album, our dynamic was very like, like there's even some points like where I would hum out the guitar melody for him to make up on an actual guitar. Like an ASL, and it's like, like I hum that out for him to write. Mm-hmm. So we would, I was also involved with the music of it too, because the melody matched the music, and sometimes it didn't match the melody, and it kind of went with it. But like we would all, I would be there while he would write, so I could be like, nah, nah, yeah, no, do this, yeah, no, put your hands here, maybe strum this a couple, three more times, you know what I mean? Like it was very interactive. But for the second album, he went to like this dark place. He would lock himself in a room for like two weeks. And then he'd come out and then he'd play something for me. And I'd be like, uh, like I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be rude. And I didn't want to be like fake. But I, I was just like, uh, this isn't like, this is not what I thought you were going to write. And in my head, I'm thinking maybe it's because you didn't let me write with you. Like maybe you didn't mm. let me interact. There wasn't you know? a, that collaboration. Yeah. So I basically was forced to write with whatever I had what I had in front of me. Like whatever I had to work with. Like do it. You know what I mean? Like it took somebody <laughs> – I can't make an analogy right now because I'm too <laughs> <laughs> But basically – No, try your best. Try your best. I want to hear the analogy. Yeah, you know, it's like just do it. But I, I did – yeah, I did my best over what I could. Um. But let me tell you, I, I still think it came out pretty fire. It, it didn't sound like it was It sounded more like a band and less like a fucking uh, e- like a emo apocalypse. You know what I mean? Like, like As a fan of the band and going back and listening to the album, uh, it's not as fun as You Can't Spell Slaughter Without Laughter. It has a lot of good high points and a lot of like yeah. hard parts. Yeah, yeah, no kind of missing the fun aspect yeah uh, yeah it is it is definitely and it's because we were all sad <laughs> <laughs> that i mean that makes perfect sense it, though it, it was it was you know the time where he was thinking about leaving already mm. it was already in his mind it just finally came out so imagine thinking the whole the whole time you're writing shit you already don't want to be in the band you're not even trying as hard so some, something I noticed on the OG version, uh, it comes naturally, which was the number one single, wasn't on the original uh, version of the album. So what? How did you? Because that song's a fucking banger. Did you guys? After the song was rejected, okay. after after rejection, the OG was rejected. We had we had another chance mm-hmm. to write. And oh, this is interesting because I almost forgot about this little part. After that was rejected, he uh, he gave us another. I don't know what the fuck happened. Nabil and I went home, and we were like, you know what? Let's give it another try, bro. I'm tripping out. Like there's some Twilight Zone shit right now. That I'm thinking about because now I can't remember if I wrote "It Comes Naturally." Like on no, your it, had to have been, it had to have been after OG was rejected. Mm-hmm. It just had to have been. But we wrote that, and it never – that's so weird. I'm legitimately tripping out about this because – It's like, where the <laughs> fuck did this song come from? <laughs> yeah, it's because I just don't remember. Remember if it was before it was rejected or after it was rejected, but either way, it ended up on the ass rejection that came out in 2011. Well, it's not on the OG version, so yeah, it's not an original know. song. So obviously, the, the the record label's like, "Yo, it was we don't like that." Come out, and now that I remember, it was supposed to come out as a single, but we only ever had the demo. So I had to re when I when I got the second chance to do Astro Rejection, I just turned I re, we remade the song from the demo and the demo is actually on our Spotify and you can hear it. It's like that's the real one that we made. Okay. It has like a it has a witch, um, 
like a hot air balloon witch. I'm actually wearing a shirt. And you just dropped that shit today. Yeah, dude. If you go look at the the picture though, for the art for the original, it comes naturally. It's a witch with a dude hanging himself with his hands in his pants, and he's you know he's getting it on. <laughs> <laughs> dude, your artwork trips me out. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Um, I wanted to the music, you know. Uh, Chris Lent, your drummer. Uh, so that's the first drummer for the for ism Fof, uh around like the astral rejection area uh era did you yeah. guys did he play a part in helping you write music when uh the bill left um he was actually a part of the og astral mm-hmm. with drums i think he may have written a few since but i'm not sure but for the astral that we rejected in 2011 um he wrote um, the instrumental for my paralyzed brother taps his foot to this beat. And he wrote a couple other synth part. Like he wrote the synth part in the Astro Rejection song. Like where, where like after all the screaming goes into like this dreamy part, he wrote synths behind that. So yeah, he had, a, he had some stuff in there that he wrote. That nice. actually wrote. Um, but the two songs that I fully programmed on there, like if if it was only me writing that album, it would have been a whole complete. It would have been a completely different album because my two songs that that I that I had produced like musically were "Life Hurts" and "Developer the Horn." And "Life Hurts" was like dark funk. That's the best song on the album, and, in oh, my opinion. Yeah, "Developer the Horn" is like I don't even know. Was that like one of the first emo trap songs? I don't know. Like, I saw you tweet it, that. Yeah, it wasn't even like it. It's not really an emo trap song because it didn't really have like a hip hop beat, but it still had the vibe of like. It had the hi hats. You know what I mean? Like it still had the melodies, and it wasn't a full band thing. It was almost kind of like maybe electronic. I would say maybe not emo, but or a mix of both. It was like you know, it was the fucking tadpole. Well, you know, like the people that argue like this isn't real emo, real emo actually started back in the 90s with fucking, uh, you know, they'll say like uh, sunny day real estate. They're going to do the same thing years from now where they're like, that wasn't the the original SoundCloud rappers like or the emo yeah, trap. Yeah. Like I set my friends on fire, started that 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, um so when the bill left was that a depressing time for you like because he was was he your best friend at that time yeah yeah he was still my best friend but i guess over the years we kind of like our friendship kind of faded because of everything it wasn't like a it wasn't like dramatic or anything it was just like a natural fate because we were going on tours. You could tell he, he wasn't really happy with the tour life, like I said. Um, I smoked weed on tour. He didn't. We weren't really vibing as much as we used to. That sounds like a natural fade, yeah. And yeah, he missed home a lot. He was a homebody. I actually always missed home a lot too. But he, he really missed home and he really wanted to go to school. But yeah... Uh, of course, I was. I, of course, I was sad because, like I said, it was the peak of the career. We probably could have kept kept going and did some crazy things, but that's just not the story. That's just not what happened, yeah. But it's fine. It's fine with me. I would have never learned how to produce, like I said, if that didn't happen. Right. So it's kind of a blessing. It, it forced you to get out of the comfort zone and to learn new skills and and, and, and now, I, dude, it's like powerful to be able to write the music and the lyrics and the vocals to things. It's like, you can just make a song out of nothing. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's crazy to be able to do all of that. You know what I mean? Dude, I specifically remember when you started dropping like the, 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 I don't know even what to call them, but like the early songs for Caterpillar Sex, you kept announcing like Caterpillar Sex coming and stuff like, here's a song here. And 
it, it was the most experimental shit. And I didn't realize at the time that you were just learning how to like produce beats and shit like that. Yeah. But like, I had no idea what the fuck I was listening to at that point. <laughs> And it's crazy because now, like, that's been over the course of, like, seven years. And yeah, yeah. I'm like, wow, I see the progression. I see everything he's worked up to to this point where you have, like, songs like uh, My Uzi Holds 100 Rounds. Is that the name of the song? Yeah, no, it's not new. It's, like, maybe three years old. Yeah, but, like, still, like, Versace, yeah. Tamagotchi. Like, yeah. you've, you, you know, you've taught yourself these skills and, like, the writing has gotten better and better and you're creating the music that, like you were destined to play like and like i said bro those songs are like the fucking appetizers those are like like what's really on caterpillar sex is like doesn't compare yeah how how fucking high were you when you made those early fucking caterpillar sex songs dude i was pretty high (laughs) but um yeah, I was on I was on some other shit. You know, I was I was hungry to make new music that nobody's ever heard of. That's like my thing. I just want to I don't want want to sound like anyone. Right. I want it to be like as soon as you hear me, you know it's me. Like 100%. Like you know, dude. And you kill me. You know, and and lyrics. That's another thing. Like I feel like lyrics are so so important and a lot of people are not trying as hard as they can at least in this scene to write the best of the best of lyrics which scene are you talking about the rap scene or like the warp tour scene i think both mm-hmm. yeah. you, change yourself you know because a, a lot of a lot of the warp tour scenes are not they don't sound like that anymore mm-hmm. you know like bring me the horizon they don't panic sound like that disco. shit anymore they, they sound or panic at the disco yeah he sounds like fallout boy now yeah mm-hmm. or bring me the horizon they sound like lincoln yeah. park now like nobody's taking the initiative even if it even if the initiative ends up sucking they're still not taking the risk to try something new you know i want to bring like the same way that rappers want to bring rock into their world and successfully make it work aka like emo trap i want to successfully bring rap into the rock world but without the cheesy way that everyone's always trying to do it Mm because whenever like when people try to do it it ends up being weird and like like when what's that guy named ronnie fucking dude from uh falling universe ronnie rocky yeah yeah it's like dude you're taking you're taking the rap thing too literal and you're like rapping and shit over it it's like he, he does like some. How, he's like emo, like Macklemore when he raps. He's, oh my god, you nailed it so hard, dude! Holy it's, shit, it's pretty corny. <laughs> yeah, dude, and I don't want it to be that at all. I want it to. I'm like, like you said, like the Versace shit. Like, I want to evolve. You know, like I want to evolve that style. You know, bring that more out to the. I think there's more to offer with it. You know, because it's the perfect blend. Um. It's not cheesy. I don't know, dude. I'm going to say some shit. It might be controversial, and I don't give a fuck. Because you, you might be <laughs> friends with them, but, like, I find that, like, a lot of people call the emo trap, like, uh, like Smart Death or, like, Lil' Aaron. Yeah, yeah. I I just think that I don't even know what to call their type of music, but it's not emo trap. It's just kind of like, I don't know. No, it's... Unfortunately, the term emo trap just kind of stuck with it because that's the easiest thing to call it. Yeah. But what else can you fucking call it? Like, can you think of a name or something else we can call that shit? Because it's just like, it's just like, it sucks that it's called that because I hate that. Even Lil Peep, I don't find that shit to be emo trap either. I just. No, it's like Nirvana trap or uh, fucking. but the thing is, I just hate that it has to be blah, 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 trap. Like, why can't it just be a word that has nothing to do with it? Like, uh... Something brand new. I don't know, dude. I just hate... I hate genres so much. Right. I just, that's why I always put post-hardcore, electronic, and experimental. Because experimental means do whatever the fuck you want. Facts. 
be a scientist. Just do whatever you want. <laughs> That's the vibe. Yeah. So, um, so uh, after uh, Astral Rejection, you know, you guys went through quite some lineup changes, but one dude seems to be like kind of the dude that's filled the shoes of Nabil, and that's your boy Nate. Yeah, yeah, Nate. He, yeah, he's, Nate he's been in the band longer than Nabil at this point, so he's more of a band member. People should look at him as more of like the I Set My Friends on Fire guy. People used him with Nabil before, actually, which, which is funny. Um, but yeah, I met Nate randomly. He hit me up one day when I was, I was, I was on a hiatus for a while, actually, like in 2011. Mm-hmm. No, after 2011, I went on a hiatus until like 2000, until 2013, until one day Nate randomly hit me up and was like, hey, blah, 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 big fan, would you ever start touring again if I got us a tour in Russia? And I was like, obviously, like, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> so he found some weird ass way to get us a tour in Russia with our like flights paid a hotel pay everything fucking paid get paid for the shows and i was like dude fuck it let's do it so we did it and then that was our first tour that was my first tour back and i was happy because before that i wasn't really i wasn't too happy um so nate's the business brain yeah and so i was happy to be touring again and that's how we got involved and we toured and toured and toured I toured so many different places and everything was going sick, you know, and everything was still going sick. Um, we just haven't toured since COVID started. So that kind of stuff. We were supposed to go on tour before COVID started. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Sucks. Uh, the one thing I want to talk about, I saw you talk about in a previous interview, but it's an absolutely insane story is the when you guys got re-signed to Tragic Hero Records, that whole fiasco where they tried announcing uh, the release date of Caterpillar Sex for... Do you, if you want to tell the story, that's fucking insane. Well, yeah, dude. Well, basically, um, somehow the offer... Okay, Tommy would hit me up like every year wanting to do to sign me. And he specifically wanted caterpillar sex. And um, hold on. And I kept telling him like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, no, I just, I don't want to be the tragic hero type shit. Basically he hit us up. I kept rejecting his offer every year. And then Nate one day was like, look, dude, let's just do it. <laughs> I really didn't want to do it, but it was Nate's idea. Um, he put a release date on so, on my album before I was even done with it. And I was, that kind of pissed me off. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. Like, how are you going to put a release date on an album that's not finished? Like, are you trying to like, and he would say some cryptic ass shit. Like, you know, man, if you don't like, do this, you never know, like, what could happen. I'm like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> like, was he you, sure? you? He, I, you know, no, like, he he was like, he, but he was like, saying something like, before it's too late, or like, I was like, are you, are you trying to say that I'm going to, like, die if I don't finish my album? <laughs> it, was, it was really, really, I, I forget exactly the way he worded it, but it was something like that. And was, was he like, even throwing any money at you to make this album or to like no 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 but i know that he knew like that i had the vision for it and he wanted to make it work out but he was i told him like i told him dude i'll make any other album you want but you can't have caterpillar sex that's what i told him from the very beginning mm-hmm. and throughout the whole time i was with him he just kept asking about caterpillar sex wanting to do caterpillar i'm like no 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 that's gonna be my first solo album technically mm-hmm. because i'm writing all the music it's gonna be all my vocals there's not gonna be any features on that shit it's gonna be me like nobody's gonna have this but me you can have another i'll, I'll write another album for you but just don't take that one he just got it kept being annoying about it and i was like you know what dude fuck this shit so he he felt bad about that and he agreed to let us go well, right before he let us go, he um he got us like a five thousand dollar like he got he got us like five thousand dollars worth of merch, mm-hmm. 
and we we didn't pay it back because he also felt bad about that so we kind of got it we just got like a free like five thousand dollar batch so basically he paid for the production of uh, my uzi holds a hundred round conscience cool. he paid for the music video which wasn't very expensive at all like twelve hundred dollars and then he paid for the five thousand dollar t-shirt bill and that's it we left and we didn't have to do anything Ah, so it wasn't a total loss. It wasn't a total loss, but it was just an uncomfortable experience. And then after we left, his whole company went to shambles. I don't even know what's going on. God bless Tommy. Hopefully he's okay. He's a good guy. But like just the way he did business, I didn't really like it. I felt like he was manipulating me. I felt like he saw gold mine in me. And that's when I realized the real value of the, of the music. And I was like, nah. It's like kind of on some Dave Chappelle shit where they gave him they gave him the fifty million, but he was like, "Dude, I'm worth way more than fifty million, motherfucker." So I'm gonna leave. Like, and I'm not on that level at all. But I I I just saw the worth in my music. He 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 made me realize like you're trying to lowball me for something that you know is probably gonna be really fire and no no other label has done really before. You know? Right. No, that's crazy, man. Um, I had another question since you worked with, uh, Travis Richter back in the day, and now he's in a band with Lil Lotus. If I die first, yeah. is it safe to say that's how you guys were introduced? No, no, no. Nate actually interacted with Lil Lotus through Twitter somehow. And we had, don't, don't take me for bom- uh, pomegranate. We had the verse open and Nate sent him a message like, yo, hop on this. He's like, hell yeah, I'm doing it. He sent it to him. Next day, Lotus already had the verse on it. And, but a boom, like I didn't even know Lotus before that. Yeah. And then well, I got his number. I, sp- I FaceTime him. We, we clicked immediately. Like we already like had been friends for years and shit. And the song just worked out really well. Like he, he killed it on that track. Yeah, like, for sure. He, he did. Like he really, really. Like that track was perfect. That little verse was perfect. So, um, yeah, I'd love to. I actually spoke to him the other day. But, um, yeah, it'd be cool to do more stuff with him because a lot of my fans really liked the little EP we did with each other. Um, we did that in two days. So imagine what we could do in a month. Ooh. So is it safe to say we're going to get more uh, collabs with uh, SoundCloud rappers? Uh, I don't know. To be honest with you, like I don't really see them title. Like I don't see like titles like that. But if it was like somebody, like I would love to do a feature with Little Uzi. Like that'd be crazy. That'd be amazing. Like, that'd, be the old, that'd be you know how crazy that would be. Like <laughs> like a Little Uzi isn't a song. It's just like it's really crazy. Just to me. And like even a song with Trippy would also be kind of fascinating as well. Um The Zilkami one is the shit I wanna say. That would be sick. If he like I don't know what what what, what was up with him, but I, I don't know if he just stopped fucking with me because he got bigger. Because this is like right before Zilakami was like about to be like like ha- be more established so he was cool with it he was even gonna meet up with me in germany uh, russia at some point because he was there at the same time oh shit we're supposed to meet up but he bailed um it just seems like everybody who's ever had respect for me also has like some kind of ulterior motive mm. or something like that guy like the guy from suicide boys yeah like like why did you take my beat <laughs> <laughs> dude I, mean, I, I don't know if he sees this one day he's probably gonna be so pissed but whatever fuck it dude I'm, tr- I'm trying to be honest you know like it's i was even in in contact with young lean at some point mm-hmm. um he's one of the you know first people to do that soundcloud shit yeah no i know uh young lean um but to be honest with you man band shows make poo poo money like mm. unless you're a data remember or imagine dragons you're not making <laughs> you're not making good band money on tour so i was thinking 
if I can successfully create post hardcore with this whole trap shit and make it work like I find the perfect ultimate formula and I somehow can get on tours with like little Uzi or your young Doug where they're getting paid like 80,000 to a hundred thousand dollars a night. I want to make, I want to play those kind of shows that make the money for sure. It, like, and it could work. Cause you know, it, I think it could fucking work, you know, like in some way, I also want to help carry X's torch his spirit in a way because he loved that kind of music and you could tell he was trying to bring that, that energy into the, into the, the genre of hip hop. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like in your face, it was in your face shit. And I love that. It was fire. You yeah, know, it's crazy how you're saying like, it's, it's weird how like the two different worlds are like, so like a DIY band that's like touring and shit like that. Like they might get paid like a hundred bucks and a pizza for the night, but like a rapper will get paid like $5,000 to play the show. Like, I don't understand why it's two completely different worlds. Yeah, it sucks. But all I know is that that's my goal is to tour with, I want to make that money. I want to make rapper tour money. Fuck this band tour money shit. That's, I don't want to tour with bands anymore mm-hmm. because I don't even consider myself a band. I mean, I'm still a band. I'm always going to be a band by nature, by spirit, but I'm so much more than that. Like I'm, I'm just like, I, I love all types of music. You know, I could write whatever the fuck I want. You know, I mm-hmm. could write, uh, electronic shit i could write acoustic shit i could write heavy shit chill shit funk shit fuck it for sure man <laughs> well back to uh talking with uh about like the money situation uh your fucking clothing line dude plutonian that shit's <laughs> fucking dope uh a lot of uh sublimation on the crazy sublimation on the hoodie yeah. and stuff and like out of the hoodie and stuff dude yeah do you have a background in like, like in the screen print world? No, no, not at all, not at all, dude. Um, I just, I've always wanted to do clothing line, mm-hmm. and um, I actually figured out that with Shopify you can make, you can do drop shipping, but with your own original mm-hmm. brand. So my my stuff is made to order. Yep. So when on my Shopify, I have stuff, I have manufacturers linked to my Shopify that make different types of clothing and they have different price margins and they have different ways of putting material uh, designs on clothing. I just so happen to know that correct, the right manufacturers on the Shopify site that can do specifically what I want with the sublimation. So when it's made to order, you know, somebody, somebody gets the thing, they make the clothing. It takes them about a week or something like that. They ship it out to the customer, but they get their cut and I get my cut and I don't have to lift a finger. Yeah, no, that's the beauty of like how the... the Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The cool part though is like, this is just the beginning for me. Now I'm actually going to get hands on and do, try to do one-on-one pieces. I recently just bought like a vinyl cutter and a heat press and I'm going to start doing like, crazy designs on jeans and stuff like that like one-off pieces so it's my story is going to be half drop shipping half hands-on original pieces sick so but yeah for one year it hasn't done bad you know yeah and i've no, always wanted it. for anyone who's watching and wants to go check out plutonian clothing like it's like really dope like hoodies where like the designs on the whole hoodie inside the hoodie. Like it's all the de- it's all about the detail with your clothing line. Thank you, man. Thanks for, thanks for that little shout out. I need that. <laughs> no, I think it's fucking sick. It, and also just a side note, it's the most MySpace thing I've ever seen uh, as a clothing line. Yeah, for sure. Dude. For sure. <laughs> I, feel you. I feel you. Because the cool thing about it is I can also put, I sent my friends on fire merch on there. I'm but, using the platform for, Plutonian clothing line slash hey if you want some ism pop shirts they're on this site too so yeah it's your, of, it's your famous stars and straps 
Yeah. I, and also, I don't, I don't know if you knew this, but I do like clay sculptures and stuff and jewelry and that. electric forming. So I'm going to start posting. I'm going to start selling stuff like that on the site as well. Nice. And uh, well, and some uh, Etsy shit. Yeah, but like really crazy stuff. Like it's going to be really cool, really cool stuff. But um, yeah, I just want to grow the brand. It's not easy growing a clothing line, dude. Like it's not, but. There, it's. I mean, a lot of people have clothing lines, so you just gotta make sure your shit's the best. Yeah, yeah. So far, but yeah, like I said, for a year, for only having a year, it's been doing pretty well. Good. So, and I'm, I'm stoked on that. Um, but there's been just so much going on with COVID and stuff. It's hard to stay like focused on almost anything. You know, like it kind of it gives me, um, it gives me inspiration, kind of because it, like you kind of feel like this impending doom and like you want to get things done before <laughs> like everything's going to be like apocalypse type shit. Right. At the same time, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard. Like, like for like my mild hearing loss and stuff, sometimes that affects me and I get tinnitus in my ears and I just can't fuck with music at all. And it sucks. Mm. But I can't let that stop me. You know what I mean? I feel it. Um, it's funny you mentioned like, like these passive incomes, like you're getting like these made to order orders where, you know, the, they take a cut, you get a cut. What about your cameo? Have you had any, uh, funny requests come through on your cameo? To be honest with you, I haven't had much cameo requests, but there's some people who just ask for such ridiculous shit that I'm like, I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> I can't do it. If I were you, I'd just link them to the cameo and be like, yo, if you want me to pay, if you want to pay me to do this shit, all right. <laughs> um, I don't know. At the same time, I'm not, too, I'm not too big of a fan of the cameo stuff. It's cool. But at the same time, I don't know. There's something kind of weird about it. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it, it's cool, but. Dude, I would fucking pay to have you fucking scream at someone. That's what somebody has asked me to do. And I just didn't want to do that because I don't want to look like a fucking idiot. Just yeah, dude, it'd be sick. Like I said, I don't like to scream without, a, without an amp. Right. So if I, maybe if I had an amp, then sure, I'll do it. But like, just like screaming like a maniac, like in a room, like I would just feel like a weirdo. Bro, I, <laughs> I think you're missing out on a big opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll try it myself and see what, 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 see what's up see what it looks like first and then maybe maybe I'll give it a go before I embarrass myself I'm gonna fucking pay to have you scream something for to all the crowd of rooms I'm gonna stick it in the beginning of this video <laughs> like a kind of like a your like your your tag yeah <laughs> like, like smoshes shut up Oh, dude, that'd be sick. I gotta think of what to say. Though. What would I say? To all the crowd rooms, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> some shit like that. I don't know. Oh, some shit. Maybe I could layer it. Like I could layer like eight lows and and like eight highs, so it sounds like some demonic ass. Like... Yeah, you got that home <laughs> studio set up in your house right now. I do have a home studio set up, and I actually, dude, I prefer it that way. I don't like going to studios. I feel like it's very, very personal when I write music, and I don't like people watching me. It makes mm. me feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I like because I really get into the zone, and sometimes I try to play around with vocals that sound like, kind of like, oh, I'd kind of be embarrassed if somebody heard me try to sing that way. Like do a falsetto or something. Right. Like, I don't want to be. I can't be my full. I can't use my full uh, creative potential when somebody's around me. I can use a part of it, like maybe eighty-five percent of it. But if you're not there, I'm probably going to be using one hundred percent of, like my final form. Well, you can get as weird as you want when you're by yourself. Like if you have someone over your shoulder, how are you going to experiment? Yeah. And get yeah. super weird. <laughs> and I don't have to argue with anyone about like what should sound like this or what sound like that i mean i argue with myself because i'm very picky and i'm very indecisive and i have so many different options for all the things i want to do but other than that 
like it really sucks to do something and then someone would be like, nah, I don't like it. And then you get butt hurt about it. And then you think of, oh, you overthink it. <laughs> Especially when the, like Nabil and I would sometimes, that would happen with Nabil and I sometimes. And it would, it would, it would cause a tension between us. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, fuck, like, that's going to fuck up the writing process that now. Now that he thinks I don't like his shit, but it's not that I don't like his shit. You just, you didn't really let me hear it for two weeks. And then all of a sudden you pop out with it. Like, at least let me see the progress every day or let me, let me have some opinions. Right. Instead of like, here's the final product. Yeah. No changes. So with being in a band and like having other people's opinions and you want things to be very like one of a kind and stuff is there ever like any creative differences well are you talking about with the people who are in the band right now yes okay so okay let me let me set the record straight nabil uh fucking sorry not nabil nate fucking nate and everybody else is in the band like chris connor hector they're all i consider them a part of the isn't pop family but i'm not signed Mm-hmm. So therefore, they're not signed. Okay. Therefore, spiritually, I consider them a part of the band. But the real, the only person who's really a part of this band, aka the original member, me, you know, it's just, it's just me. So they don't write any of the music. Okay. So I, they're just I'll, touring musicians, basically. Yeah. Like, um, Nate did help me with Pomegranate. Nate also did help with Uzi. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah other than that though like like the the demos before that i don't know if you heard them like my little cabbage planetarium i heard them all man dude you heard all? yeah dude okay so like those yeah they had nothing to do with with those songs like it was all right. me was all right me. so I, I i take pride in it being all me because it's just like i want it's like it's like picasso you know like when Picasso was painting Picasso shit. There wasn't another painter behind him with another brush helping him. It all came from his mind. Right. I want it all to come from my mind and be appreciated that it came from my whole mind. Right. You're was, the creative uh, core yeah, writer. Like, yeah. Like I, it's kind of like when people look down on ghostwriting because you didn't, you didn't write your own bars. Like, no, I want to write my own bars. I want to write my own musical structure myself i want this to be my project nobody else's project it sounds kind of selfish but at the same time like i'm just giving you me fully you know what i mean sure matt i think uh we're ending on a a great note right there so true artist uh one of a kind head of the curve Matt, and we might even get a fucking intro for the channel with his screams in it, like the Smosh thing. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been saving this the whole interview, to tell you, but okay. thanks for watching, guys. This has been To All The Crowd Rooms. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell. You get the alert as soon as the episode's posted. And thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> I'm a fucking narwhal. First things first, fuck all press. What does the whiskey shirt say? <laughs> Eat pussy, chug whiskey, hail Satan. Are you able to beat your own song, FCP Remix, on expert mode? I've never actually tried. I've never actually played it. And a hardcore show, metalcore show, in Philly in general, Philly is just a very open scene and pretty much accepting of you. He just looks at me and spits in my fucking face, dude. So I sp- Bit in his face, and I threw the peanut butter jelly sandwich at his face. Everything's watched. Everyone's watching. I saw you guys just put out that uh, it just turned 14 years old today. This is my newest one. This is my favorite one that my dad has built me. He built this for me last September. Ripped off a urinal off the wall, and I discovered it the next day on the ground covered in... We got fucking, we got barf, we got fucking spoiled milk, we got rotten fish. It smells like throw up in this room. You're watching so all the crowded rooms. This is Liddy.
<laughs> what would your next creative outlet be? Probably, I'd probably be a terrorist or a porn star. The fact that Icy Stars has the worst claims. Shut answer, your fucking mouth! You listen to Waking the Cadaver <laughs> for fun! And today we're going to be talking about a rational poll by the band 156 Silence. We're going to be talking about the album Slow Decay by the Acacia Strain. And today we're going to be talking about Code Orange's new record, Underneath. 